Hello there and welcome back to Digital Foundry for this, the 139th edition of DF Direct Weekly, which remains our weekly discussion show uh, where we talk about the latest gaming and technology news. And uh, joining me is the usual panel. First of all, John Linneman. Hi. Hey, Rich. I'm still here in space. That's not a TV back there. That's a window. <laughs> okay. I'm just getting ready for Star, Star Citizen talk. <laughs> okay. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm convinced. And uh, yeah. Alex Battaglia. Hello. Yeah, I've, I've changed dimensions again. I, for a while, I was three quarters perspective to oh, the yeah, left, yeah, yeah. and now I'm back to the old position, mainly because I, I decided to stop being lazy. I, I yeah. like the old position with those. <laughs> you got nice PC boxes back there, rather than the mystery door. Yeah, mm -hmm. the mystery door, which definitely doesn't, you know, lead to a hellish dimension of pain and pleasure. But, uh, it does. Rich, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And, of course, your uh, wonky shelves for the OCD yeah. amongst it's us. It's not wonky. It's the wall that is wonky. <laughs> I swear. This building's over 100 years old. Either way. If, if I was doing the edit, I'd be putting a rotation effect on your footage. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and then you realize I'm rotated at that point. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, before we move on to our first news topic, uh, we've actually got some news. Um, oh. In a bizarre twist of fate, which nobody saw coming, the DF merch store has actually been revamped with new products, uh, new T-shirts, <laughs> new apparel, as I believe it's called, quote, unquote, wow. apparel. Um, yeah, hoodies, T-shirts, uh, hats, uh, mugs. Uh, we've also got our first community shirt, the DF Fighters uh, shirt, which um, we've been trying to get out for literally years, but it is in theory available to buy now so link in the video description below and mm -hmm. yeah if you want to support the team that's a good way to do it and uh yeah mm. uh, hopefully we'll we'll sort of build up on that get more community shirts out we need this quote unquote uh t-shirt for alex yeah we need a works fine on my pc shirt <laughs> works fine on, or, also i like the the quote uh the drop water on it i i wouldn't mm -hmm. mind a drop water drop on it, water sure. on it yeah just like yeah. dumping a whole cup of water onto a cpu or something yeah okay it's so good so alex what, what would you say then uh for rich's presentation of the merch on a scale of one to linus how did he score <laughs> i mean it was shillerific but it could have been could have been a little bit more intense. I mean, Linus is been. really good at that, I gotta say. But, uh, <laughs> uh, like, you know, selling merch, like, that's the thing, right? But that's pretty yeah, good, I'm Rich. Not, you did, you I'm, did... I'm not a salesman. Sorry. All right, all right. No, no, you're yeah. Not. <laughs> I'm convinced, though. If if I was, I wouldn't have been calling the merch store a bizarre twist of fate. But <laughs> yeah, I know this was long and planning. Rich. Yes, <laughs> meticulously, <laughs> carefully planned, and definitely, as all our plans have now come to fruition. Uh, apparently uh, but anyway look check that out it's going to be awesome um, and uh, yeah we'll update you with new products uh, as and when they appear um, but first of all I guess we should move on to the proper new stories of the week real new stories yes yeah okay so first new story of the week well that's actually a new story of last week <laughs> um, um, the last yes, of week um, Yes, basically what happened last week, we always filmed DF Direct Weekly on Friday morning. Friday evening, it turned out that Sony had managed to leak its own trailer for The Last yeah. of Us Part 2 yeah. remastered. And uh, this basically um, meant that, rather unfortunately, Naughty Dog had to um, basically reveal all of its plans um, ahead of when they were planning to, which uh, is, is not great. But we do now know what The Last of Us 2 remastered is all about. And, um, yeah, obviously we had um, issues and problems with uh, Naughty Dog going back to basically redo a game that they'd you know, only basically just finished a couple of years back and which already played great on PlayStation 5. But, John, it actually turns out that this is not a full remaster um, slash remake. It is more of a kind of, how would you describe it, a director's cut, a retooling, bonus material, native PS5 port. And yeah, I think we're a bit more comfortable with this project now, right? Yeah. And actually one of the supporters, Greg Brown, asked that specifically, do you think Naughty Dog would have been better served calling it T Loop Part two, or T Loop <laughs> T Loop Two Director's Cut, since it seems like they use remastered to match the remake of part one. Right. Right. Yeah. seems like it would have been similar right. to death strandings next gen edition, which didn't see the same backlash. And I 100% agree. Uh, this feels more like a director's cut release than like a proper remastered sort of game. And yeah. I think that it sort of, 
when you see the remastered tag on there, it makes you think it's something perhaps more than it is. Uh, but most of the new stuff they've added is much more in line with a director's cut release, right? Uh, yeah. Where it's like, you know, unreleased content, new maps, some new modes, and all kinds of stuff like that, in addition to some improved visuals. Uh, though to what end, we have yet to find out, obviously. Yeah. Um, so given that and, like, I guess the $10 upgrade charge that they, they have, which I think is fair for all the extra content that they're adding to it, uh, I think it's really just a branding thing. <laughs> and the other... So calling it remastered, I think, is a mistake. And the other thing that I think would have made it... Uh, would have improved the reception is a PC version announcement at the same time. Say, hey, it's coming know, to man. PC and PS5. It's director's cut. I'm pretty sure people would not have had much of an issue with that. And I think everyone's kind of expecting a PC port at some point. Uh, I'm I'm genuinely surprised because I feel like with The Last of Us 1 remastered, when they announced it, didn't they also kind of say, yeah, there's a also a PC version in the works. Yeah. It's going to come mm -hmm. later. And there was no hint of that here, which yeah. kind of surprises me. It does it does it though? There was such a negative reaction to uh, part one when it came out because the port was just not very good. Yeah, but this would have been their uh, chance maybe they to just wanna, poor. Maybe they just want to sidestep that whole controversy or make it, you know, they've obviously been robbed of, you know, a great deal of their marketing beats for this particular project. So maybe they had the ability to hold something back, you know. Right. That's, that's possibly the, the, the explanation there. Yeah. Mm. I mean, what do you think about that, Alex? I mean, obviously, it is going to come to PC. The work has been done, really, in know. terms of... That's, well, you, you, you would think yeah. the lessons have been learned for PC, I believe. I also think, arguably, the only reason why this exists is because there's a PC version. Um, like, they, you know, they with Last of Us Part 1, they most likely that was about bringing the engine and the tech to PC in the first place, and then was about getting part two which is very similar in a lot of ways onto pc like it would i'll agree with john it's so weird not to see the pc announced with it in terms of like because like that's sony's new push but at the same time um the extremely poor reception to the first uh part when it launched which was very justified in my opinion oh, it yeah. was very poor poor at yes, launch it was. um and it got much much better over time still i think it could be a better in a couple areas but uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, I, I think, yeah, then it makes sense that they would maybe want to save that for a point when they can maybe show it off better with more controlled messaging and uh, perhaps a bit more details about it. One thing that I would have really liked about a, about this is they did have like a short blurb. It's basically a sentence about uh, what is better and beyond DLC uh, equivalent like changes to the game and that like um, that like roguelike mode they're adding. Um, beyond those, they talked about like uh, 1440p upscaled to 4K resolution for a performance mode. Yeah, but they don't say necessarily what they mean by upscaled. Uh, there. I think Do they it's mean... going to be just a stack. It'll be like part one, right? Which is yep. just you know yeah. 1440p upscaled to 4K. Nothing crazy there. I, I mean, they could. I mean, they could. I suspect do an FSR2 pass, but I don't think they need to. Um, uh, yeah, basically, if we look at this, it's be saying that uh, it. Enhanced graphics, native 4K output mode in fidelity mode, 1440p upscale to 4K in performance mode, unlock frame rate option for TVs that support VR, so, increased texture resolution, increased level of detail distances, improved shadow quality, animation sampling rates, and more, which kind of sounds similar to what was happening in prior uh, native PS5 ports of Naughty Dog games. I right? think, Rich, the yeah. thing is about that is uh, the, the unlock thing for VR TVs is the, is the key. Like yeah. if you look at the Uncharted collection, for instance, if you run it in native 4K mode and just turn off the frame limiter, it's actually pretty high and close to 60 FPS, if I recall. Yeah, and but like part one had really big issues with that mode. Oh, that's true. You know? Part like one was Oliver talked about it back then. I don't even know if it's in the game anymore. But I feel is like the 40 the, FPS mode still this, in the game on the first one. I guess the question is: Is this going to be heavier than that? I suspect not, because it doesn't seem like they've done as much to it. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I think the game in its original form still looks absolutely superb. Like, I think it looks yeah. better than a lot of modern uh, current gen games being released these days. Uh, it's But obviously it had an insane amount of money and time poured into it. So, yeah. yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, there has been some controversy, which I think is a bit sort of overblown about the fact you need to pay for the upgrade. But you know, $10 for what is essentially DLC, I don't see that being a problem. It's actually more than that, really. I mean, it is a native PS5 version of the game. But I think the point is that there's a perfectly good PS5 version already. You've got the 60 FPS unlock for the PS4 Pro version, which is, you know, if, if you're happy with that, you know, that's yeah. basically um, one of the big key enhancements that you would have expected to get from PS5. And you've got it for free if you want it. So I don't really have too much of an issue with the pricing. Um, you know, there are mm -hmm. comparisons to other games which have, you know, done free upgrades. You know, like The Witcher 3, for example. But um, Gears of War. Gears of War. Yeah. Another one. Yeah, that's another one. I don't really see a problem with charging like a $10 upgrade fee. And uh, it's not as if you even need to spend, you know, I guess it is going to be a full price product, but there's nothing stopping you buying a used copy of uh, T-Loop 2 on PS4 and, and just paying the $10 upgrade, right? So mm -hmm. I don't really have too much of a problem with that. Um, and I guess this sort of leads us on to the discussion of, you know, what's going to happen with Horizon Zero Dawn, which was the other remake slash remaster <sighs> slash unknown as to what's going to happen with that. I'm wondering whether it's going, to, it's going to be much the same thing as this, where it is, you know, I suspect it would have to be more than that, I guess. Um, it could well be some sort of uh, enhanced version of Decima. I don't know. Um, any thoughts on that one, John? I mean, that's kind of like the big unknown now. We were concerned about The Last of Us Part Two getting a remaster, and that's kind of not really a concern anymore. But where do you think this leaves Horizon? Mm, I feel like they're going to have to do, do if, a bit more. Yeah, I feel like more work needs to be done to bring that up to spec, because mm. the whole point of The Last of Us Part One uh, was to bring it up to spec with the yeah. the sequel, right? So that they actually look comparable. It's using that technology. It's, you know, obviously a lot of the technologies developed for part two went into that. They also pushed it a little bit further in some areas, but by and large, it's very much a, those two games feel like, you know, they're connected directly. Horizon Zero Dawn, not so much. That's significantly less impressive than the sequel, as you would hope. But uh, mm. so I feel like a lot more work would need to be done if the goal is to bring it up to Forbidden West, which maybe it's not actually. Uh, that'll be the question as well. Is it is it just going to be that? But didn't that also receive a 60 FPS PS5 patch? Yeah, right. exactly. Mm -hmm. So what you know, they're going to have to do more to it. It's just, oh, man, as I said before, <laughs> open world games like that. And I know. I a lot of people love them, but I and I enjoyed Horizon as well initially. But those are the types of games I just don't see that much purpose in replaying and playing. You know what I mean? Like The Last yeah. of Us is is almost like I would say a film. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it has a lot of cutscenes and, but there's plenty of gameplay in there as well. But you know, revisiting something like that is like popping in a film that you enjoyed and going for a second round, right? And that's I think that's quite enjoyable, but. These open world games, like revisiting them, just it's a lot of time. It's so I'm much sure. time commitment for you know something that I better stop before I get in trouble from Horizon fans. Right. Actually, <laughs> but <laughs> well, I mean, it's fine to have an opinion about something. You don't have to get in trouble about it. I mean, and just my it, like, I'd say like The Witcher Three is one of those games where I could imagine revisiting it and at some point in time because you would maybe make uh, moral decisions in the game which could have ramifications for the larger story which is the big part of the Witcher games Gosh. in general oh, I'm so, uh, I'm so, so glad I turned the corner you know, on The Witcher 3 after years of not enjoying it and then finally yeah, I mean, playing all the way through it it can, you get it after a certain amount of time and it's mainly due to the storytelling and the moral decision making the open world trappings are obviously oh, still an issue in the world in the world of the witcher 3 i would have been today. happier with a smaller game world that was more uh detailed and dense but yeah you're right that's not why i love the witcher 3 now it's yeah it's like skellig the game or novigrad the game that would have been interesting uh but yeah i, I see exactly what we're talking about here for me I really still hope they're not making anything on that, and I'd rather see those resources spent toward a new, unique, smaller experience for that same amount of development time and money. It doesn't need to be another AAA open world game. It could literally be just a, like a really small, short experience, or and that's enjoyable. If they must do a remaster, Killzone Shadowfall. Killzone, 
Yeah, remaster one of the Killzone games. Actually, yeah, I know people would, people would rather have Killzone two. I would say, but I actually think Shadowfall. I I maintain is a really interesting, well designed game that felt like they were looking at something like Crisis and they wanted to make their take on that. Uh, yeah. But unfortunately, it didn't register with a lot of people, and it does have some rough edges. Uh, it's not as straightforward as like the typical Killzone campaign was, and yeah, it's uh, it, yeah. It, it landed with a bit of a thud. But I still think that there's there's something really cool and smart about that game, and it's a lot of fun to play, and it could well, really coming benefit. up to the ten year anniversary there, John. That's right. Oh yeah, good point. That's right. Oh my god, still goodness. still holds up. It's yep. it's a, a beautiful game. And it sounds mm -hmm. amazing too. Like, good lord! Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I guess the, the other thing about the Last of Us Part Two remastered, which I find quite intriguing, is the concept that they're including some in development levels that never made the final game. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's just a really interesting concept, I think, and it, it will give players the ability to see part of the development process. I mean, it's, they're going to be extremely rough, right? Probably just block levels. Uh, mm -hmm. But it gives you an idea of how Naughty Dog works, which I think is really, really compelling. Oh, I'm yeah. really quite excited about this release now um, because you know there's, um, you know, it's. I think it's fairly priced. Yeah. Uh, this survival mode sounds interesting, um, and you know, native PlayStation Five app with all of those um, uh, HDMI 2.1 modes in there. I think it's you know it's a worthwhile upgrade. I think you're getting your values your money's worth from your extra $10. So yeah, the release date there is January the 19th next year. So not so long to wait either. Wow. Um, anything more to talk about this one? Uh, just if they're going to release it on PC, please do a good job. Uh, like, <laughs> I, do not, I do not, I do not want to make another video saying this sucks. Like I'm tired of making videos saying something sucks. I want to make a video saying this is great. Uh, yeah. So yeah, who's ever responsible? I don't know who's making it, but please do a good job. Please do a good job, please. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, I don't quite sort of figure out how that's going to compute. It's not as if you can <laughs> yeah. say, yeah, you know, the sort of inverse is don't do a bad job, right? You know, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> You know, what do, what do you how do you expect them to process that information? Um, linearly, just, yeah, <laughs> just do a, just do a good port, please. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, I guess that's all we got to say about this one. So let's move on to our next news topic. Okay, so we got two news stories concerning Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Right. Two news stories. Um, first of all, it's been announced that there's going to be an ultimate edition release, which in theory um, is you know, really compelling, right? Because um, we've been looking to see physical editions of actual finished games, you know, fully patched, all content. And uh, this is on, you know, in theory, what the ultimate edition should be. Um, second part of this is that we're going to be talking about some experiments Alex did with uh, Cyberpunk 2077's DLSS 3.5 Ray Reconstruction with some uh DLL swapping shenanigans. Uh, but John, I'm going to go to you first mm. about the Ultimate Edition, because in theory, this is all really, fairly straightforward, right? It's essentially a game of the year update that brings together all of the content. The game is complete. The patches are there. It's just lock and load, right? All wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah, it, it is technically that, I would say, but right. uh, there was some kerfuffle this week <laughs> regarding <laughs> the kerfuffle. the <sighs> packaging of its DLC within the physical version. So I appreciate right. that they are releasing physical versions of this game across each platform. And in fact, um, th so this is more like ownership versus preservation. Cause I would say if you really want to preserve this game, the GOG version, uh, and actually I think steam as well, they don't have DRM, right? So that's, that's actually yeah. really awesome. But if you want a physical disc version, they're now offering this for Xbox and PC or PS5. Here's the here's the unexpected twist, though. And it's actually kind of hidden in their initial press photo. If you look at the three side by side, is that the DLC uh, Phantom Liberty is not included on the disc for PlayStation 5, but it is included on one of the discs with the Xbox version. And that led to some confusion over what's going on. Uh, and so... I've spoken with plenty of people about repackaging disc versions for release. 
And I have some theories as to why the PS5 version doesn't include it. So I'm going to share my theories. I don't have any insider information to what CD Projekt Red specifically has done, but there's there's two things. First of all, um, it is true that many PS5 games thus far that have had these re-releases did include DLC as codes. Unfortunately, Final Fantasy VII Remake uh, Integrate, for instance, that had the DLC as a code. And basically the issue here is is that to get it as a separate thing for the disc where the DLC is integrated requires you to create a new build of the game from what I can tell. And then that has to go through like QA and like, you know, the whole, uh, the whole process, basically the submission process and get through all that. So there is actually R and D time and effort that must be spent to do this. But as of 2023, I have noticed and other people actually pointed this out to me, that there's been a number of games that actually do ship with DLC on the disc and it's installed through the system menu and sort of listed as optional DLC that you can actually just select and install off the disc. On that oh. front, I actually think that that's something that they must have added to the SDK in the last year or so. So I think this is a yeah. fairly new thing. I don't know 100%, but I can't find any instances of this being available in older titles on the PS5. So I think it's new. So what may have happened, if I had to guess, is that CD Projekt Red did not want for whatever reason, even they did this for The Witcher 3, they didn't want to make a new separate version of the game to go through all those processes with the DLC integrated, like an actual complete version. Like and, Horizon Forbidden right, West. Right, like Horizon Forbidden West, mm -hmm. and in fact, The Witcher 3, uh, which yeah. has a complete version. But also, it's possible that they are using an older version of the SDK for, for Cyberpunk, and maybe that does mm -hmm. not support this like DLC integration onto the disc as well. So mm. I think that they there still could have been solutions for them to follow, I think, but clearly they determined that uh, they didn't want to jump through those hoops, and so they did not. And as a result, you don't get the DLC on there. And that, that right. is kind of a bummer, I think, because it would be nice to have everything, the patch version, the DLC, everything included in that version. Uh, but you do get it on Xbox. And that is yeah. That's the one thing I was wondering about. So that that like, what is, is what's particular to Xbox that allows it exactly. Uh, I think Xbox has had this ability to integrate that into a disc version for a long time. Basically. Oh, okay. Like I don't think this was ever actually a thing. Sony's right. previous method of basically requiring you to author a new version, a new complete version of the game, seemed to be the hang up that a lot of games ran into. Right. Uh, oh, okay. and so now they seem to have fixed that, but cyberpunk's not taking advantage of it from what I can see. So it's kind of All like, right. it's not really a case of like anybody specifically is at quote unquote fault here. It's more like, yeah. uh, the, the way things played out, none of the solutions happened in the right order, right time to sort of allow them to do what they wanted to do for whatever reason. And as a result, you know, this is what we have. Although I did mm. see some funny theories from people online that saying it's oh it's actually because uh, CD Projekt Red is still salty at Sony for taking their game off the store clearly and I was thinking I'd love to see well, that in a business review where where they quote unquote are salty and won't do something for a release because they're mad at another company. This is kind of bizarre because you know <laughs> we're talking about you know, multi-million dollar businesses here. Yeah. They don't interact in that way. <laughs> no, they do not. <laughs> you know, this kind of pettiness that exists within the fanboy community does not translate into the boardrooms of companies no, like not Sony like Interactive Entertainment and uh, CD Projekt Red. It just doesn't. It's just a logistical issue, right? One way or another. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what it is, right? And, you know, it's just, it's just bizarre, some of the stuff I see posted online. Utterly bizarre. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to say about that. I guess it is just, um, you know, on the one hand, you're quite right. You know, in terms of preserving the game, there are DRM-free versions yep. available on PC. But, you know, you would have liked everything to have been collated together for console owners as well. And there is a case of preservation of specific versions, right? Also, um, um, the PC version, not surprisingly, does not come with discs or physical media. It is code-based. 
but mm-hmm. it is of course DRM free. But uh, when Baldur's Gate three was announced for physical release, somebody actually asked Larian about this. Like, why is the PC version just a code in a box? And they had actually explored different options. And then one, they found that the, the number of users with Blu-ray drives in their PC yeah. is so tiny, right? Zero. So that would have like been no useless for most people, right? Uh, DVDs, yeah. not viable, just too small. Would have taken <laughs> an insane number of them. But they also <laughs> actually looked at USB as an option, like a USB key. But they found that the reliability of them was was too low, and it would have resulted in potentially too many cases of defective product ending up in the consumer hands, and it's just a hassle oh, for wow. everyone. So. It's interesting that they actually did do the legwork to try to find a solution for that, and they basically determined that it's not worth doing, uh, mm. which is a shame, I mean, but it makes sense in the PC space. But again, CD Projekt Red is probably doing doing the right thing here for PC users, where it's like, here's a code that grants you access to a DRM-free version that you can then save and keep, and that's cool. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I still think they should have done the disc in the case of Baldur's Gate because the collector's edition is never really about utility. I, I it's agree. About, I agree. That that would have been about awesome. It's pure it, preservation. It's about, yeah, right? it's about the yeah. item. It's about you know yeah. having this wonderful thing, and having you know not having the game mm. within that just seems kind of bizarre. I, I agree. I still agree. But it's nice that they actually did at least think about it and you know and okay. write about it yeah, right somewhere <laughs> um well let's move on to the second cyberpunk story of this uh, particular week which is that um obviously alex when you did your uh content for um dls 3.5 and, mm-hmm. and Cyberpunk 2077, uh, Ray Reconstruction was looking really promising in some respects, but um, there were clear issues in other respects, you know, essentially because it's an emergent technology, right? And um, neural networks mm-hmm. have still to be trained uh, to, to the optimal condition. And you likened it to the origin, the origins of DLSS 2.0, which had, you know, issues to begin with, but has iterated over time into what is close to, like you, one might say, the, the, the finished article. Right. So for Cyberpunk, I guess what you did here was to take the DLSS 3.5 DLL from Alan Wake and then just stick it into Cyberpunk, right? <laughs> Pretty easy. Yeah, they updated Alan Wake's most recent version, came with a newer version of the DLL. I think it's like the most, most recent patch, actually. Um, So I saw there's some writings online about it. And, you know, I don't, I like, I wanted to test it myself mainly because I don't always trust everything I read online about subjective (laughs) image quality. Really? You you don't believe it? No, I don't. I don't. So I was curious about it. And there are differences. Um, but you can still see, I'm going to, sorry, I've got to bring up my phone for this because, uh, uh, I don't have a screen in front of me. So I'm going to be like looking at it over here to like call out all the times of all the things I looked at. I looked at a specific scene in the game by swapping out the DLL. I have the original, like, um, like I have the current version of the NRD denoiser on the far left. So the NRD is the one that, that you get if you don't turn on ray reconstruction, if you're not using RTX GPU or you don't like ray reconstruction, et cetera. That's the one on the far left. Then to the right of that is the original launch version of the game's reconstruct ray reconstruction. I save all my video files. This one's slightly compressed. So I've to make it all even, I've actually slightly compressed all the other video files here just so <laughs> that they're perfectly in sync in terms of bit rate. And then to the right of that is the current version of the game with its current version of the Ray Reconstruction DLL. And then the far right is the Alan Wake 2 DLL injected into the game. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a lot of, that's four different recordings. It's all a lot of injections. Mm. It's a lot of injections. I'm going to hit the play button. Um, <laughs> basically here, the first thing I want to call out in this scene in my original video, I looked at this one gentleman, this presumably drugged out gentleman at a shack at the bottom of Night City. Um mm-hmm. When he would move his head and loll backwards and forward, you could see that there was a huge ghost behind his head in the original launch ray reconstruction image. As you go progressively to the right in this image, looking at each more updated version of the game and updated DLL of ray reconstruction, you can actually see that it disappears incrementally. There's still a tiny bit left, actually, using the Alan Wake 2 ray reconstruction DLL on the far right. But it is, I would say, quite a bit better than the launch version. There's also some differences in like the normal map response on the character's back, which I found interesting. Uh, no idea what caused that. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that um, some of the, uh, how do you call it? 
the sharpening that yeah. I pointed out, that like yeah. original it's, over sharpening. It's quite egregious. It's mm. awful. Yeah. If you look at the back of this, I don't know what you call it. It looks like a desk lamp on the on the on the table here. Uh, if you look at the little wire snaking into the back of it, you can actually see that the ghosting amount, the amount, sorry, the amount of sharpening that is there. Like you can see, like a like a rim bit of light oh, yeah. on the <laughs> outside of it. It's gone down progressively with each version of the game and each version of the DLL. I would still posit though that it is still there to a degree. Yeah, it is. Um, That's what gives it this you, oil painting like look. I find this AI upscale yeah. kind of nastiness. But the interesting thing, though, is, uh, and I talked about this in the Alan Wake 2 video, is it doesn't seem to have that. No, it doesn't. Really. It really does not. So there was an interview you can check out on the uh, on the web about this. WCCF Tech did an interview with Jakob Knopik, who I also talked f- with for that Ray Reconstruction Roundtable video. And uh, they pointed out in that it- interview, Jakob, that they've been working on the game since then. There's probably going to be another update soon enough to the game. And they're going to be looking at some of the issues with the ray reconstruction in it. I presume it's going to be about the sharpening. I presume they also mentioned how they've um, changed uh, some of the indirect lighting to make it more like coherent. And actually, if you go online and you look at other sources, I believe there was a GDC or GTC presentation about how they did um, restir uh, as in the ray selection technique for the direct lighting in the game, they um, they mention actually that they did not use Reaster GI for the for the indirect lighting. They just used straight up like rather naive sampling. So if they changed that to Reaster for the for an update to the game that is going to be coming out soon, that would actually have um, big benefits for the quality of the indirect lighting in the game. So if they did that for an update that's coming out, that's going to be interesting. Uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about. So you can look at there's other. So, you know, comparisons I made here that Oliver is going to be showing on screen. I showed off like texture differences. You can see that there's differences in the way a texture looks versus the original version of the game. Uh, there's, you know, just stuff like that. But another thing I wanted to point out actually was um, I've got to scroll ahead in the video myself. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's the very low tech way to do this. It's not your standard digital foundry thing. One thing I want to show off that is still in the game is there's this NPC here standing here. And on the left-hand side is the NRD denoiser, and the right-hand side is the um, ray reconstruction. Uh, And one thing that the original denoiser has issues with is actually doing any sort of, like, indirectly sparsely lit areas. Oh, yeah. Uh, The NRD denoiser has trouble actually getting any sort of, like, specularity looking right, any detail, shadow detail. It's, It's pretty rough, actually. Um, so on the left hand side, it looks kind of like blown out and rough and it's le- m- m- totally lacking in detail and lighting detail. But on the right, there's more light and detail, but you can see a ton in this shot, a ton of the, I would, I'm going to call them AI reconstruction errors in them where you see, look at the guy's face. It looks like weirdly like blotchy and yeah. like <laughs> there's lines drawn on it. And if you look at the background, I do like the enhanced lighting detail, but one thing you should notice is that I and I'm gonna say like this is something they really need to work on for ray reconstruction is that lines that were once straight on the left hand side and I'm gonna call them proper even though they're lacking lighting detail on the ray reconstruction side they're wavy yeah yeah like they they, they have they have stylization that, in them that shouldn't be there that's what gives it that so, that AI upscaled look There's that's what gives it the AI upscaled look and I think this is a perfect shot to show off the issue of it so if they are updating ray reconstruction the game if they're working on ray reconstruction over time this is like a perfect use case scenario go to cyberpunk in one of these overcast areas where there's like a bunch of stuff in the way it's just completely indirectly lit and look at people's faces and then try and match it from there also and that will, that's like the key I think the ghosting there when he moves his head is pretty it's intense intense <laughs> like wow yeah and that's the that's the current alan wake 2 denoiser right there i think i have that labeled correctly um but either way so i want to show this off yes it is better in terms of overall amount of i would say the details better i would say there's a little bit less sharpening and i would say that the ghosting is turned down in the one specific example i called out but the key hallmarks are still there and this could be a cyberpunk specific issue it could be a ray reconstruction specific issue or both. it's hard to know it's hard to know, but it's still there. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well, it's interesting to see progress so quickly, though, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, games... it's only been two months, right? So. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so, you know, breakneck advances there. I mean, uh, yeah, it is still an emergent technology, though, but it is just so promising and uh, potentially game-changing. And it's it's great to see there is actual improvement happening there and actual response to feedback as well, which uh, uh, sometimes happens, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Sometimes happens in an extremely slow way. <laughs> yeah, like years later, you realize it's different or something. But like here, no, I think um, behind the scenes, just from what I hear, that they've taken the response and criticism of Ray Reconstruction's initial outing so far, and they are working on it. That's what okay. I've heard behind the scenes from unknown sources. Mm -hmm. So we can believe the internet in this case, Alex. <laughs> to a degree. It's not perfect. Degree. I, I would okay. definitely not say it gets rid of ghosting. It, it's still there. Okay, fair enough. Right. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the next news topic. Um, so this one is um, slightly alarming and, and, and disappointing. There's a report from gamesindustry.biz this week concerning year-on-year um, -year sales trends for the consoles. And um, yeah, I'm just going to read out uh, a bit from the gamesindustry.biz article. PlayStation 5, comfortably the number one console in Europe across tracked markets. UK and Germany not included. Well, that's two very big markets oh there. Oh. Anyway, PS5 sales up 143% over October last year, driven by the availability of stock this time around. Nintendo Switch uh, number two, despite a 20% drop in sales compared with last October. I mean, you'd kind of expect yeah, a decline, right? End of life, yeah. basically. End of life, but you know they've had a storming year in terms of uh, in terms of software releases. Yeah. yeah, but this is the thing that's concerning, right? Xbox Series S and X sale sales continue to struggle in Europe, down fifty two percent, fifty two percent year on year. Now, you can put this into context by saying that the general um, sort of um, uh, appreciation of Xbox in EU markets is significantly lower than uh, UK, US specifically. I mean, those are kind of more Xbox strongholds. But even so, you're comparing like with like here and the concepts that you're moving into what year three of the generation and you're posting a 52% decline in, in mm. hardware sales. Um, I don't really know where to begin with that. Um, John, <laughs> I'm going to come to you here. Obviously, there has been a, a, a somewhat drastic changing strategy from Microsoft across this generation. They're moving away from the concept of Xbox as a box, bizarrely enough. That's right. yeah. Um, uh, yeah, they're talking about it more as a platform and they want you to be able to play Xbox, quote unquote Xbox games on pretty much any piece of hardware. So we've got the cloud, um, we've got PC and we've got consoles. Even so, though, this this is alarming, right? Yeah, I think this is a, a confluence of factors here. So as you said, Europe is not the strongest market for Xbox. It has not been. And I think the, the thing that's happening with, with Xbox Series S and X comes down to basically the software available combined with the Xbox shift towards services, right? So a console tends to, to live and die by its big exclusive titles and the buzz around them, right? The hardcore players get excited about something, they're into that platform, they early adopt, but then the rest of the market tends to follow them traditionally, right? Like if there's excitement around the brand, uh, the people that are perhaps less hardcore, you would say, they feel that excitement and they want to get into it. And I think that's what's happened with switch and PlayStation five, because I don't think Sony's done anything particularly outstanding with the PS five, this generation. Uh, they've, they've just sort of delivered a solid platform and it does have some exclusives that people are excited about. Basically hmm. Xbox, despite all their software development houses, I don't think they've had a very strong generation in terms of software that says you want this console. And that doesn't, say that there's not amazing games for the Xbox. It's more, when you look back at, say, the Xbox 360, right? I just re, uh, reattached my Xbox 360 to the FW900, in fact, upstairs, and was sort of going through some of the old games, and it reminded me of what the buzz was like for the 360. The types of games Microsoft was publishing back then uh, in multiple types of genres you know, obviously the big stuff like Gears and Halo had insane buzz, but then, you know, there's the Mistwalker stuff like Blue Dragon Lost Odyssey and just tons of stuff. It was a very exciting time for Xbox and they, they have not been able to replicate that uh, 
this generation at all, in fact. And instead, they are going in on on these services. But that's not necessarily all bad news for them, right? Because they have clearly found their own new niche and they're trying to blaze trails in that area. And I think you can't really look at the Xbox brand as a whole and, and just say, oh, it's the console sales, because I don't think that's the it's game they're right, playing man. anymore. Uh, which, you know, that is a, that's a, that's the business strategy, strategy that makes sense, uh, is to try to find new areas that aren't covered by the competition and make your own mm-hmm. success there, which they're doing. So I, I basically mm-hmm. think it's this lack of buzz, the lack of big exclusive stuff. Uh, coming to the console combined with you know the history of xbox in europe that it just kind of makes sense that it wouldn't uh have a huge impact i would also say even this doesn't include germany but even in germany i have noticed i don't know how much retail sales even matter at this point and i think they do matter to companies (laughs) like nintendo uh but i have noticed in the last year that xbox has kind of started to disappear from the shelves in germany where you go to like Media Mark Saturn or any other sort of chain, uh, the Xbox sections are either disappearing or becoming smaller, like very small. And I mean, when I walked by recently and there was just like one shelf with Xbox games and then like a top 10 list up there, but the top 10 list was blank and slightly falling off the wall. <laughs> I was like, uh, this is weird. Someone's not taking care of so, this. Yeah. Whereas like the PS5 and especially the Switch section was gigantic and spilling out across there. And even the PC sections at Media Markt are still surprisingly large, I would say. In fact, I bought for Audi a PC boxed copy of AEW Fight Forever <laughs> that, that they put out. PC boxed yeah, copy? Yeah, they had that. What? Yeah. That's when I found uh, Psychonauts uh, on the PC as well. They're still selling that yeah. in the stores with the soundtrack That's CD. That's awesome, though. Pretty nuts. But uh, so I suspect it's all this mix of things happening, right? But, you know, right. as but I'm they, insinuating, yeah, they, it's the out, Forza uh, Motorsports out. Those were like the two key, you know, tentpole titles for Q, uh, well, Q3 re- slash Q4. So the thing Here is, when I say there's not big stuff for Xbox, I don't, I just mean I'm specifically talking exclusives to push people to want to buy the hardware. Xbox doesn't really have that anymore because, and this is good actually, I would say, they have their PC push as well. Uh, you look hmm. at a game like Starfield, right? Bethesda games. Where are those games the most popular? I would say yeah. PC. Mm-hmm. They are PC games first and foremost. That obviously is useful for Xbox. It has plenty of sales on Xbox, I'm sure. But I think the driving factor there is a lot of people are going to play on PC. And that's fine. They own the company. That's They they put that game out, right? So wherever they get yeah. the sales, they're, they're benefiting. And that's going to be the case with a lot of this stuff. So it's not really doom and gloom in that perspective. But then there's been... It just... The, the state of console gaming, when you really think about it, I, I just can't... I mean, you you were there, Rich. You remember what the Xbox 360 was like, right? Like, the buzz around that thing? Everything that could have gone uh, Microsoft's direction, apart from the Red Ring, yeah. went in Microsoft's direction. They had a year head start. They had a cheaper console. They had a more powerful GPU. Um, and, you know, they had uh, momentum, right? Because you know, that year head start gave them momentum. They had third parties lining up to support the platform with 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 great games, and then by the time PlayStation arrived, um, you know the third parties were really sort of you know getting into the swing of things, right? You know, two thousand and seven, where you know there was actually competition from you know from from Sony. Um, all of those third party games, pretty much to a T, were all better on yep. Xbox three hundred and sixty. Yep. Markedly, and you had yeah. the first party stuff, which was just phenomenal. Which um, I, I still think man, you know, right? stuff like Crackdown was just like game changing. And you know, if you go back to that entire period, there were just you know incredible games. You know, Bioshock came out fairly early on in the generation. Uh, same with they Assassin's had, Creed, the first Assassin's Creed, three hundred and sixty games. Yeah, 
it was um it was actually you know it was a proper event okay so the game did, you know had some issues but you know you were seeing things that you had hadn't seen before on a console and it was fun it was a phenomenal time although right? still i mean assassin's creed was multi-platform better on 360 but bioshock while it did get a ps3 port it came much much later so there yeah. was cases where third-party games were launching first on 360. Same with something like Mass Effect. Mass, Mass Effect, Effect came out in 2007. My gosh. They had Halo yeah. 3 that year. You know, all the Bungie Halo stuff coming out. I mean, we laugh about stuff like, oh, there's Master Chief on a Mountain Dew can, right? But, like, that that That's was what part was. of the energy that was driving it. People really knew <laughs> Xbox. Literally. Like, it was a big deal. And that was probably the time when Xbox had the most success in Europe, I'd say, as well, right? Like... <laughs> Uh, it it captured a decent share of the market here as well, and it was yeah. it's, it was a big deal. And it's just we've lost that. I, I should point out that actually in Europe, PlayStation Three w- did buck the trend versus you know UK and US. It it was yeah. it was a, a big seller in Europe, even with all of these yeah. negative factors attached to it. I mean, it's quite funny now when we you know whenever we go back and look at Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty and PlayStation Three. Um, software head to head, the 360 <laughs> is is so far ahead. So far ahead. So, yeah, so far ahead. So, when you've got both that. resolution and um, performance, performance uh, improvements, uh, that's it, that's quite a big gap. I mean, the exceptions were pretty much stuff like Criterion Games for somehow was able to make really good versions on PS3, and then also yeah, like the PS3 Dead Space is guys. a lead platform. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. So those were good. Uh, I guess Final Fantasy thirteen, but there's, yeah. there's really not, there's not that many. <laughs> it's most <laughs> mostly three hundred and sixty has the lead. I I, yeah. I would say I I'm curious what you guys think. I look at what's happened with Xbox over the last couple of decades, and I think Don Matrick's push towards Connect and the way that they marketed through uh, the Xbox One at launch was like the pivotal point that that caused the most like damage to the brand yeah and they've been forever trying to recover from it i think the brand itself and the mind space around it is way better right now than it was at the time but they they squandered so much of their goodwill and like the excitement around the brand because of that one decision which one could also Mm -hmm. lay at the feet of nintendo so in the end the Wii may have damaged the xbox damaged the xbox because they you know that's what connect was about was an answer to the Wii, right so yeah mm-hmm. and it sold well it i mean initially. people liked i mean some someone liked connect apparently um but i <laughs> they, do find they it liked funny it for you know uh, like the first like couple day. of days hey, they tried. the dancing stuff was good on there it was fun yeah yeah um mm-hmm. one thing i want to talk about that i think is funny about this is that that dometric era that initial push and then the marketing around it kind of killed it all but the launch games are kind of more interesting than we got at launch on Xbox Series consoles. I agree. No. I was thinking that too. You like, got stuff like Killer Instinct, man. Like that game's awesome as heck. And like the launch for the series consoles, you had like some patches to bring up some games. Okay, look, it's not just well, Killer spec. Instinct. They also had so Dead Rising Three, which you mm-hmm. know it had some technical hiccups, but it was good. They had Rise Son of Rome, right? They had Forza Motorsport 5, which going back to, actually, it's pretty solid. It looks amazing for that platform, and it has more personality than the most recent Forza, I would say. Uh, It's really solid in that. Uh, They had Crimson Dragon, which, not amazing, but it's kind of a spiritual follow-up to Panzer Dragoon with some of the same people involved. So it's neat that it's there. But then, over time, you would get stuff... Like, in the first three years of that system, we also got stuff like... uh, Halo 5, the Master Chief Collection, which, while flawed at first, was, you know, it's still pretty cool. Sunset Overdrive was there. Um, Gears Ultimate Edition, I guess, was there. And yeah. There was actually, there's a bunch more stuff uh, that's slipping my mind at the moment, but there was some some really cool original stuff coming out. Oh, Forza Horizon 2 and then 3, I guess, also came out during that period. Uh, mm-hmm. Like the first three years of Xbox One, the only reason it really kind of didn't fare as well is that the PS4, that was like Sony on fire in terms of just like putting out quality stuff with a good machine, right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. both of them were competing at a very high level, I would say, and both platforms were actually quite good. 
Uh, Xbox's mm-hmm. problem simply stemmed from the way they initially pitched the one following, you know, the Kinect stuff. And then the fact that the console was seen as less powerful, which it was versus PS4, which was really just, you know, a, a weird turn for Xbox since up to that point, the Xbox was all about was more being powerful. more power, the most powerful console on the market. Uh, what a drop. And they got oh back gosh. to that, of course. But <laughs> yeah, so man, it's just weird how, how much, how they've really struggled to get out of the shadow of that. Uh, but, you know, again, they found a new market with Game Pass and stuff like that. And, I, you know, I I think they're doing fine. But it is right. interesting to see. The I think there's market. another thing. You're right about the confluence of, of different factors. And um, PlayStation's strategy has been extremely straightforward, which is to say they want to get consoles in homes, right? Yeah. So you're looking at this 143% year-on-year increase. Um what have they done to do that? I mean, they've built up momentum by basically discounting the console. I mean, over the summer, I bought um, a PlayStation 5 for £400, massive discount. Right now, right. it's um, you can get one for as low as £360. Is There's some crazy stuff going on there simply because they want to shift consoles, get consoles into homes, get people converted into PlayStation Plus subscribers, and it's basically, you know free well, i wouldn't say free revenue but it's revenue that's yeah. that, that's accruing every month per user basically because you kind of need that subscription mm. um, we'll talk about subscriptions in a minute john because that's yeah. slightly worrying as well but i think you know basically there's momentum there with playstation where the strategy has been really straightforward discount the console get it out there it's only now with black friday that i'm actually seeing um discounts on series x you know yeah, 360 pounds yeah it's like you know why didn't this happen? Also, the, the storage card finally is going on sale. <laughs> yeah, that the that little Seagate card. drive, Jeez. which yeah, I I needed one of those. <laughs> mm. Did you buy one? Yeah. Okay. Because it's like you know I, I'm tired of running out of space on there. So. Yeah, fair enough. But they were the one terabyte one was like over two hundred for so long, and I found one for like one twenty nine. So. It's still uh, such a dumb price, though. Was the one or the two? Uh, I mean, this, way, yeah. this, it's, it's 52%, the percent. <laughs> it's fifty-two percent decline year on year is alarming, but you've got to kind of couch it within the overall business, right? Which Strategy? we just don't, don't know. Right. It's just one alarming statistic. The other, <laughs> the other thing, though, we were talking about the Xbox decline, and Sony's doing very well on the market, but I actually think PlayStation, in terms of what they release, has lost a lot of its identity. When you look back to PlayStation 1 through 3 and even 4 with its indie push, it was all about this like eclectic mix of, of titles. You had the big AAA stuff, but in between was all this like more smaller scale games, often pushing like wild ideas and concepts, tons of Japanese developed stuff. That's where they were so strong, and that's what made those earlier PlayStations truly great. PlayStation 5 barely has any of that. They've almost completely mm-hmm. killed it off. And it's now mm. just about these big ten pole releases and remasters. And that bums me out too, because it's it's just they're they've changed the way they're playing the game and uh it's not necessarily what I wanted from them anymore. So mm. yeah. the state of console business is a bit not great in general, outside of say even though the Switch is very underpowered by the today's standards, I still think Nintendo is running a tight ship over there. And they're doing mm-hmm. some; they're putting out a lot of great stuff that fills Quality. many different interests. Okay, well, it's going to be interesting to see. Well, obviously, we've got the uh, the Game Awards happening imminently. Jeff, oh yeah, the Jeff. Oh, games. Jeff is going to be Jeffing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, there was basically no Microsoft presence at the awards whatsoever, apart from Phil being there <laughs> physically in the audience there wasn't really much in the way of announcements or anything so i'll be interested to see whether they actually try to turn that around try to drum up a bit more hype i mean there's stuff happening so you'd expect things to be uh to be to be happening in due course so let's find out what they are i guess um but in the meantime i don't really have too much more to add to this i guess we can move on to the next topic okay So our next topic is that, well, this week, Half-Life celebrated its 25th anniversary. They've updated the game. um, So it is now actually Steam Deck verified. (laughs) You can actually play it on Steam Deck, which is a good thing. And um, there was a documentary released. I've not actually watched it yet. I've been a bit too busy. But, John, you have. And uh, what do you think? 
Yeah, so this one was done by the awesome uh, No Clip guys with Danny O'Dwyer and his team over there. Super nice dudes doing awesome work. Um, mm-hmm. And this is awesome because I got a lot of original developers from Valve that worked on this game and really put you in the mindset of what they went through to reach the finish line on the original Half-Life. And, you know, a lot of the stuff I kind of knew in terms of the ambient detail and what was already out there, but they sort of fleshed it out with some additional detail. So I do recommend watching it for that. But I still love how uh, they were just like this ragtag bunch of, of people that wanted to just make this cool game. And they had Sierra as a publisher at the time. And this this is famous that they did this, but... The end of 97 comes along. The game is supposed to ship. This is what had been previewed. And then they decide this is not good enough. Uh, we need <laughs> to we need to remake everything, basically. And they mm-hmm. did. They did. And as they say in this, um, they they basically set out to do it on their own money because the publisher, you know, saying to the publisher, yeah, we don't like what we've made. We're just going to redo it all. Uh you know, a publisher is not going to want to hear that. It's like pay for this not all over again. Right. Especially yeah. when you expect it to come out. And, but that saved the day. And as far as I know, they kind of did the same thing with half-life two as well. Seven, right. seven years later. So that it's an interesting situation where they have enough funds to be able to develop it up to a point where they're like, okay, now we know what works and what doesn't let's redo everything with this new knowledge. And that's what they did. But half-life, Half-Life was, man, what a special, special time. Uh, I don't know. Did, did, did any of you guys buy this on day one back in the day? Do you remember the hype? No. I do. I, I was... remember the hype. I remember playing it. I played it at work. But uh, I don't remember the day one experience. I, I definitely. So this was, this was a time of big releases. I was actually more hyped at the time for Sin. And I bought that day one. But anybody that's played that uh, from... The, it's uh it's a gigantic mess the, the launch day version like it's one of the most broken games i've ever seen like it's completely busted go look up the original sin release it is a mess so then we have half-life coming along and i'm like okay that also looks great i'm excited for this i go to the store with a buddy of mine an eb game selling pc games i i buy half-life he buys king's quest the mask of eternity and we're like, well, we'll just take turn. I'll play Half Life, and you play this, and then we'll swap. I think I got, <laughs> I selected the better game in that case. Uh, yeah, but yeah, Half Life, as everyone knows now, I mean, it was it was one of the first first person shooters to really try to put you in the center of like sort of a almost like a storytelling experience, right? All these scripted sequences and things happening around you, and they specifically say in this documentary that they wanted something to happen. Like every, I I don't remember the seconds. Something escapes at every three. Was seconds. it every three yeah, seconds? Yeah. That's something that's like insane. that. Yeah, but it is something like that. It's like <laughs> something interesting must be happening all the time, which is a lot of work, I would say. But that's basically how it is. It's like you're always seeing something new. Things are always happening and around the player in a way that you're not used to seeing. And then they put a lot of emphasis on the interactions between the player and the AI and the way that the soldiers react. I liked how they described. Uh, when they were struggling with level design in that original version, they actually went back and told the level designers, try to create something, put the AI in this box, see what they do, and try to experiment and build and watch their behaviors. And so they learned to build maps and areas and spaces that the AI itself worked well with, right? So they kind of right. built the maps around that so that the AI could show off its best features or its ability to perform and interact with the player. And they absolutely mm-hmm. did that. And the way they focused on the sight lines, like there's that one part where the player enters a room, there's a catwalk up above, and then there's the lower space. And then you spot the enemy soldier in the lower space first, but there's also guys above you and just the way they move and react and, and behave with the player. Uh, it was really, truly revolutionary at the time. Just everything about it. It, it was mm-hmm. also heavy, it's moderately heavy. I remember it running okay at launch, but I definitely, this was the era where if you didn't have enough RAM, every time something big would happen, a game would like stutter as it fetches the data from the hard drive. So I used to think, oh man, I bet this was the coolest thing ever because like the whole PC would seize up for like literally like two or three seconds and kind of stutter <laughs> as it would load the next thing. And that definitely happened in Half-Life. Yeah. Uh, 
it's but yeah i mean it's it's aged very gracefully i think but Mm -hmm. it also had it it had i would almost say a negative impact on the industry to some degree because it also it's the grand theft auto effect that gta 3 would have as well where it did something so well and so new that everybody else wanted to do this too and I think it actually robbed us of some potentially great FPS games that could have been made as they shifted to try to copy Half-Life or integrate Half-Life-like things. That's why I think we're lucky we got something like Halo Combat Evolved, which was like, no, we're doing our own thing. And they absolutely did uh, mm-hmm. versus Half-Life. But I think that's why games like Daikatana were perhaps... I mean when you look at that schedule, it wasn't delayed that long, like not by modern standards. It was nothing, but Daikatana was not that well received at the time. time. Yeah. And it does have some problems. Don't get me wrong. And this needed to be fixed in patches, like fan patches, but it's actually more of a straightforward doom style game with some interesting things bolted on. And that just was not in vogue anymore at that point. Right. And I think half-life, I don't want to say to blame for it, but, Half-Life shifted expectations of what a shooter could and should be, uh, which definitely mm-hmm. had a ripple effect, I would say. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, what What are your thoughts uh, on Half-Life? For me, I played it a year after release. Okay. That's 1999, pretty good. And um, essentially, I just remember going to a friend's house and them loading up what was, oh my God, what's the level where you're moving around the on the ca- uh, the, the, the oh, railway? The railway, uh, like on a rail or something? Level? Is it, It's on a rail, yeah, yeah. And I remember just being like, you can push around a rail car and then get off of it. It just felt so, I don't know, it felt really free form. And that is actually one of the more free form levels actually in Half-Life because you, you can go all around this track, get on and off the rail car. Doom 3 has it's it really too. Well made. <laughs> Doom 3 has it too. They had less it successful. Later. Yes, less successful. Uh, <laughs> less <laughs> successful. I don't like that part of Doom 3 that much. But um, I, I thought that was really awesome. And then loading up any of the mods that had just started coming out at that point, like just to die for. And I I spent much of my youth playing Half Life and Half Life mods. It's probably one of my most played games of all time. Wow. That, yeah, it's like super way up there. I played so many Half Life mods, all of them you can think of. Uh, I love Half Life as a result. And the one thing I really like about the new update is that they go back. And they kind of are trying to perfect the game because over years, the releases on Steam have introduced issues into the game and just how it plays with modern systems and also just some expectations in it. And they're bringing back some of the things that I think make the game look and feel better, like the the new main menu being more like the old main menu in terms of design. It still has a little bit of... Uh, steam stuff in there if you actually look at it but it actually brings back that like feeling of opening up the original half-life menu and like seeing like the wand stuff and like just clicking on things and seeing the menu animations which all look great and they bring you into a mood uh that was pretty much lost by the time you get to something like counter-strike 1.5 wasn't it like like that steam era when they yeah when they launched steam they had the steam version of half-life and that's when all the menu changed to look just like generic steam Super mm. generic, non-moving. Half Life Two would change that, obviously, with the 3D background. But like it, you know, it's just stuff that like went away. Also, like adding in the ability to just click on and off texture filtering. Half Life is a game on the like. I don't know how it was arted specifically because the game has uh, a software render in it initially. Yeah. I don't really know, but like it does look really great actually with crunchy textures too. I, I think it was um, intended to be played with texture filtering though. That's how they always I showed agree. the game, and that's how, you know, the hardware mode was the main focus at the time. Yeah, that is true. But you know, like stuff like that that I really like them adding in for people who want to experience the game in that way. Um the one thing that I almost wish they did add, but they can't really do it without a huge overhaul to the game, would be a contiguous half life. Uh, with right. zero loading screens mm-hmm. oh that would, well i would love the thing is alex half-life. is i feel like the loading screens have become so short at this point that you you <laughs> can't even read the loading text anymore like it's it's like a blip. <laughs> it just goes it, the loading yeah. times in half-life are now shorter than the average shader compilation stutter <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you it's just like it's games. like a blip basically it's like yeah. the checkpoints in halo basically 
Yeah, each shader program is probably like a couple, you know, Half Life levels. Yeah, that would be the one thing I would really have loved out of the release. But another thing that's as part of making it Steam Deck verified is actually now the game supports natively controllers, which it didn't in the past. That's true. At Mm -hmm. all. So if you want to play this game with a controller, I wouldn't. It's Half Life, but you can now. And that's probably going to be pretty okay. Should have brought the uh, split screen option from the PS2 version (laughs) for some co op or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming, you know, there's there's mods on PC. I don't know if there's any split-screen mods on funny. PC, to my knowledge. But, you know, they've um, uplinked Decay. All these things are now in there. You can find PC versions of them, uh, which All is right, they so, they put Uplink in there, the demo, Yeah. right? So that's now optional to play in there as well, because they did that. It was a standalone demo of Half-Life back in the day called Uplink. That's true. I've, right? Mm-hmm. And it was, you know... It was pretty cool at the time because it was a separate thing from what was actually in Half Life as the a game, game, right? So it was a totally mm-hmm. unique thing, and now it's officially in there as well. They also just yeah. uh, they this was initially bro- this has been broken for years and it was still broken, but they just fixed it like this week. It was the tentacle scene right when it's like banging on the silo, which is an mm-hmm. awesome scene by the way. When it would actually smash the glass and grab the scientist and like pull him out. Uh, up until this latest patch, the scientist w- would basically be floating. So like the tentacle would try to reach him out and it looked like he was like a couple meters away from the tentacle and he would just fly out of the room. So they basically <sighs> broke that, which was not broken in the original, original version. Uh, yeah. They've gone back and now fixed that too. <laughs> yeah. And one thing they did years, years ago too is now Half-Life can actually be played with high f- refresh rate. The original Half-Life has AI turning speeds. Oh, right, right, right. Re- so if you turned up the the uh, the frame rate really high, uh, say you'd be at like 120 or like maybe even 240, which is really easy in Gold Source, the AI would turn slow, slowly that they could never shoot you actually True. as you were moving around. I love that. Or like AI couldn't like that. Your AI like Barney and the scientists they couldn't like open doors correctly because they'd like turn like couldn't this for like an eternity. Uh, but those are things. Obviously, I wonder how the speedrunning community answers to all these things because the speedrunning community for a long time would abuse frame rate on locking uh for the half-life games uh so i have no idea what they're doing these days also uh separate from that but i've been playing the team beef port on the quest 3 which is also you know that's the half-life vr port once i got Mm -hmm. that running that's it's good it's just like all their other conversions that i talked about last time it's cool revisiting that in vr because now you can play half-life one two and all the episodes and alex all in vr wow Mm -hmm. which i think is is great it's good. It's it's cool to have standalone Half Life on the Quest running at a high frame rate like that. Just mm-hmm. you know, it's fun to walk around within those environments and and see all that in VR and the VR aiming and such is great. And it just you know, it's exactly what you would think, but it feels really good to play and it's nice to have it. And I've actually replayed Half Life Alex over the last couple of weeks on the Quest Three itself, and I think it might be my favorite Half Life game now. <laughs> I think it, wow. yeah, that Alex sense, is though. so good. It's so good. Uh, man, I don't want to go too much into that right now, but go. I did a video on it years ago where I was, I still think Boneworks is great too, by the way, but I, I feel like Half-Life Alex has aged better than, than I expected. And it's just, it's so smartly made the level design, the encounters. It's true. It's, it's like, whoever did it like they didn't lose the valve spirit like all three of these games plus the episodes they just they have something special like they're always trying to push boundaries in terms of just the scenario design in the things that you do in these games uh Mm -hmm. and that's that's what makes the (laughs) half-life series so interesting and i can see why it's tough to follow them up because they are built both on new technology and also introducing players to things they've never seen before Every Half-Life game has been about that. So Mm -hmm. that's not an easy thing to do. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Wow. A lot to talk about with Half-Life. Yeah, it's a great (laughs) game. It's an amazing game. Uh, Yeah, that documentary definitely well worth checking out. Um, But I think that's all we've really got to say about that one. So let's move on to our next topic. Um, Well, here we go. Star Engine, Star Citizen, another big 26-minute video posted uh, (laughs) by the developers. (laughs) Only 26. Uh, only 26 minutes. <laughs> shame. For um, shame. Alex, why don't you talk us through it? This is your game. What's going on yeah. there? What are we going to get excited about? So this year is actually something, well, they showed a, a, a version of this video at the CitizenCon that I talked about 
three weeks ago now two Mm -hmm. weeks ago how long ago was it uh but since then they re-released it and they changed some things about it uh because they they showed a work in progress version of it like it had like obvious funny bugs in it with like the ai they like reintegrated a new version of ai in the game and it's like the original one had them like running into like stairs at some point and they added some other nice things in it but the reason I want to talk about this is because it shows like John last when he, when I talked about it back then, John asked me a question like, what is it like when you just move around in, in Star Citizen? And this video is a good point to show off like what it means to like go around in the game world. Uh, uh, it takes some liberties with the aspect of like you would be in a ship in this game. You wouldn't be in it, just like a free floating camera, but it is also constrained in the exact same way a ship is like at multiple points in this trailer it'll go into what is like the quantum drive state where it brings you fast, like close to the speed of light to actually move around in like a, a good pace. Otherwise you'd be taking, you know, <laughs> a really long time to go between planets. Uh, but they do that multiple times in the trailer and you get to see like you just moving from one planet to the next or moving to like a jump point in the game. And it gives you a sense of the scale because it, you like start off at like the solar level they start off the really cool like wing commander recreate worlds origin systems like the conductor opening up the level like really great callback to the wing commander games or origin games and then it moves into like looking at a planet and that's like one thing that they added to this trailer that's really awesome is there's like the relative speed on the right hand side and you can see it tick up close to like the speed of light at times Mm -hmm. and they also show the amount of distance covered in the game because they're moving you know ridiculously far like you know AU's levels at one point when they go through the jump gate and it goes through all the kind of things that over the years that Star Citizen that has made it such an ambitious and interesting project um it's showing off things that you just don't ever see in games like there's one point when they're going through the atmosphere on I believe it's one of the planets in the pyro system so the latter half of the video like really beautiful blue clouds oh dude and then all of a sudden you see like right yeah oh. i think it's you see a okay. reclaimer which is a ship that use that it kind of is in the game so pay, players can salvage broken ships and like detritus in the in the universe detritus. and uh sell it on the market and they sh- they show it coming down through the atmosphere and they show like all a bunch of people on the ship going around trying to fight a fire that had broken out on the ship as the ship oh, yeah, goes in down the central core. And these are things that like you know like multi-crew gameplay something you only really got in like star trek bridge commander if you've ever played it uh, a couple other games try and achieve it in a like um like in a 2d space but like actually a 3d space where that's just only one part of the game world that's very very interesting and then it kind of just goes around from place to place showing you off showing off to you a bunch of gameplay systems that the game has been this is, there's a reason why this game takes a really long time to make uh, like you you get a sense of that through the scale of the trailer itself which is pretty rare in a game to show off all these things it takes 26 minutes to do it and they do a very good job with it um and it takes time it's got really great atmospheric music in the background from isn't Pedro it also uh, an unbroken cut like it's just one camera isn't, yeah i mean yeah of course you, you talk about like the god of war games this is actually an unbroken and it's cut. cool it's because it covers so much ground <laughs> It covers a lot of ground. Um, one little thing I want to talk about that I want to critique about the trailer, though. I liked it a lot, a lot, a lot. But for some reason, I don't know why it happened, but it's a 4K30 upload. Uh, it's pretty, it's compressed fine enough, but uh, there was a lot of macro blocking in a lot of scenes, especially the, the space scenes that, uh, I don't know if that was YouTube or if it was the upload itself. Hard to know. But there was also like a constant semi-persistent tick that would happen in the frame rate and oh, yeah. or in the video itself. Uh, it happens uh, a couple times when it's crossing the planets and you can see it. And it's like, I didn't actually stop and do frame by frame looking to see exactly what it was, but I, I would imagine maybe a 60 hertz container video would have done better. Uh, for any of these issues in general. The rest of the issues can... Another thing that's really interesting to talk about this video is they're showing off the game running in what is a DX11 client, actually. The game doesn't have Vulkan in Whoa. right now. And the irony of this is that they're showing off all this density and da-da-da, and it's running under DX11. And it really goes to show that like a PC-made game, in spite of all the issues that it has currently in the current version of the game, it can still achieve like densities far greater than all the DX12 games we've ever seen before under dx11 clients so it's like oh there's there's you know there's a lot to talk but can about can it here. do it's the dx10 minutes. water <laughs> yeah they have even better than dx10 <laughs> water john um i imagine like if you if you're sitting me right now talking about it 
I just say go on to YouTube, click a link, find it. It's pretty easy to find. Watch it, sit down. It's really, really enjoyable watch. Uh, it gives me super serious, like when they initially showed off like Crisis, they had all these really cool in-engine trailers where they would show off a variety of things in Crisis in the environments itself. Yes. And they're doing that here. You know, like the original Crisis trailer from like, X07 or something like that shows off like the bridge with the ropes and like the 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 barrels falling on it and you're just like I've never seen that in a game before and here they're showing like off like ridiculously awesome water sims or like spaceship crashing sims or just incredible scale of going through like planetary space transitions stuff you just that just don't happen in any other I games. Agree. It gave me those serious vibes. So, like, if you love tech, watch this trailer. Don't you don't need to buy Star Citizen. I'm not I'm not that guy that says you need to buy it. But just be in awe of the ridiculous ambition the game has, and uh, yeah, enjoy the pretty sights and sounds. It's a very good looking trailer. Man, it does it, look phenomenal. It kind of just reminded mm-hmm. me of um, I mean, different games in the end, but the sense of scale is what I was hoping for. It was Starfield in the end, but having yeah, played then, through that game, it ended up feeling very small you know what i mean it just yeah, with everything it's... being segmented and all the loading screens and the zoning and the way it just works and then eventually you just use fast travel because there's nothing really to see between <laughs> the spaces it's a very it's a very different game it feels very small and it did not really capture this feeling of space being a huge well space daunting uh, thing and the, scary thing this too, of course yeah. is just a, a trailer video and you know star citizen has its own crazy history but man like this gets me excited for space games again in a way Mm -hmm. like this looks yeah this is the type of scale i want to see in this type of game Um, yeah and i think i think the scale is really about selling space that's the one issue that with starfield like you're saying like if you can fast travel then it kind of cuts it cuts out the interesting aspect yeah. of like the you were talking about all the time Death Stranding John like the A yes. to B should be interesting in its own right and Star Citizen I mean it's a sim game so your level of enjoyment there is <laughs> how much you enjoy going through space at you know like relativistic speeds but you know it's there and there's a whole game built around these things it's really that. It's a lot of fun. That is the difference. It's a lot of fun there. To play with You're exactly right. Yeah. It's the journey versus the the reward. And a lot of open world games, including Starfield, like they're all built to like what happens at point A or point B is is the interesting thing, and everything in between really isn't. In between, which yeah. is also weird because Bethesda's prior games were pretty good about the in between stuff. I'd say, and yeah, I think Starfield they, they, just it got away from them in terms of scale because to make something that. As, with as much different many different places you could go they couldn't really deliver a world like that arguably that's where the interplanetary travel could have like they could have still had you loading from they, they could have not had space to ground transitions but they still could have had like the equivalent of the skyrim you leaving winter run or whatever the name of that what is that what is the name of the oh, yeah, main yeah, city yeah. first one you get to i forget the name of it uh, it's not winter run that's that's game of thrones probably <laughs> uh but like you get there and that's a load you get in the city but when you get out of the city onto the countryside that's the more free form yeah bethesda uh you know pro- like you go between places and discover things well the problem there is that there was nothing there was nothing to discover there because it's like most planets were like one city and then just like generated terrain that had a border that you would run into so there wasn't yeah. there was never there wasn't any purpose in actually going out there most of the time and that yeah. It's kind of the bummer. Like even, oh man, yeah. I know what yeah. I know what it is. I think they made a good game for what it is. It's just it didn't do the thing that I was hoping it would do, and that's fine. But that's uh, fine. I still want yeah. a game it, like that, and does not. It doesn't. Yeah. It, it like obviously different games, different strokes for different folks. Uh, this is Star Citizen is absolutely not starfield in any sense no it does not completely try to different. it's an it's an mmo yeah, yeah, yeah um but one little thing i want to call out at the end here There's a lot of great stuff in the trailer but also if you go to the very end of the trailer the star engine logo which they see apparently just coined is actually the origin systems logo it's got like that the 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 comet and the like the burst starburst at the oh, end of the logo. you're right so they're so they are it so they're calling that. back to a lot of old chris it's at the very end it's, of the yeah, trailer yeah. so that's so cool scroll to the very end of it uh it's it's the 
it's the old origin systems starburst with the comet it's very cool um but it's good to see this game seeing more success now in the last couple of years it seems to be keep growing and uh i'll be covering it on the channel as soon as it is humanly possible I, <laughs> hopefully with john and yeah. then also a tech look is due well, at some point Alex, too, there's there's a lot of cool. stuff. you said you were going to look at star citizen again when they moved to vulcan and that was like three years ago and they still haven't moved to vulcan yet so yeah so that was your I mean, arbitrarily imposed <laughs> that was my arbitrarily imposed date but i'm pretty sure that's the maybe the version after this next one we'll see they said they have it done see you in three they years. even have like really they have really great <laughs> posting like they have a developer board oh my god it's so great all the developers like usually chime in there but their graphics programmers do and they were talking about like pso compilation stutter they were talking about race trace direct lighting as well too that they want to maybe get in the game after they finish off gi which they showed off at Gen citizen con too so you know they're very interactive and it's like picking up pace now okay. finally alex we need we need to do that video together culminating in a visit to citizen con no <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's i think citizen con is always somewhere in the u.s these oh. days they used to have multiple they used to have a german citizen con i think yeah but they kind of they, pulled they it should back bring it that. back they should have it here in frankfurt Bring it back, Jared. Okay, look, let's move on to our next story. Okay, so to round off our news stories this week, it's actually some personal news, I oh. guess, in that finally, finally, Digital Foundry <laughs> has received a uh, new PlayStation 5 Slim. Uh, obviously, this is old news at this point because the unit has been available in North America and Japan for some weeks, but um, it's only just... Um, actually, it hasn't even appeared in, in Europe yet. We've got a projected release date of uh, November the 29th, so still a few days. However, I found on eBay a Canadian supplier that was willing to send me one. So guess what? We're going to bring back the Digital Foundry unboxing, and we're going to unbox the new PlayStation 5, which I'm sure is going to be riveting entertainment for those who are listening the to the audio version. <laughs> it's not quite what's in the box, Rich, but it'll have to do Ma well, make sure you we know crumple as box. much paper and make as many sounds as possible in front of the microphone so that they get that audio. <laughs> we, need real, we need real time feedback to understand your some, experience. What is it called? Right. ASMR? We need some uh, haptics. Some haptics. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, here it is. Let's, uh, let's Wait, bring here it up. Comes. He's pulling it up. It's the, uh, it's the modern warfare bundle. Um, actually, let's have a look at the front of it. Is it really? It is. Wow. Hard it is the Modern Warfare bundle. Oh, and, there he is. Uh, there there is. he is, yes, the, Captain the, Price. The slim, the slim model there. And, uh, well, yeah. let's take a look. I've taken the liberty of uh, of cutting the tape in, in order to expedite entry Don't, to the, to the uh, unit. I remember, Rich, when you unpacked the original PS5, you ripped the box and people were coming for your head. Upset. That's right, yeah. They were very It mad. wasn't actually the fact that it was ripped in the box. Oh, that's true. You, it in. you didn't rip it. It was ripped. <laughs> I didn't rip it. the right. box. <laughs> yeah. Which nobody could, well, certain uh, aspects of the audience couldn't couldn't accept. <laughs> no, I, Rich I had was to, disrespecting I, Sony. I had to rip a bit of uh, paper packaging in order to disrespect the PlayStation brand. <laughs> Um, but in actual fact, the, uh, the the wrapping seems to be a bit thicker this time. Around. Oh, Maybe it's okay, just, that's uh, good. Oh, it was well, let's get it out, shall we? Let's 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 move it for this. All right, here we go. It's coming out of the box. Yeah. Captain Price is sideways I mean... and bumping the mic. <laughs> Soap, open that box. I am going to the box actually just to get it out more easily. Don't, don't have to. Here we go. It's coming out now. There we go. Oh, you yeah. slipped it out of the case. Here we go. We've gone from uh, a box to another box. A totally <laughs> nondescript box. So you Let's unbox the up. box. I'll say this is no RTX 4090 unboxing. That now that is an unboxing. <laughs> if you know that package. Well, let's have a look. We've. Uh, Oh, wow. This is uh, instant gratification here. <laughs> Wait, what is it? The, f the first thing that we've got. <gasps> It's, oh. the, it's the horizontal stand. It's the horizontal stand. Mm. Yeah, the little oh, pegs that we've at. got there. Look at that clear piece of plastic. Wow. Look at that. Look at that. That's <laughs> awesome. It's crystalline in appearance. Yeah. Mm. The the production value is is immense. Are there mold lines on it? Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> As it is, it's probably it. a... Yeah, then it's molded. Okay. Okay. Molded plastic. Cheap. <laughs> and um, straight off the bat, we have uh, our power cable. Oh, it's, a, of course, a US-style power cable. US one. I imported it from uh, from Canada here. 
Uh, Does Canada have the grounding <laughs> plug thing where it's like the different size prongs? No, no, no. It looks like a standard North American U.S. Oh, because in the U.S., a lot of those plugs, like, one, like one side Third? is larger than the other. Okay. Is it really? Yeah. And, oh, wow. like, if you look at the figure yeah. eight connector, it's not actually figure eight. It's, like, flat on one side and then round on the other. So, what do you guys think about them? Like, the PS4 Pro had a literal ATX power cable, didn't it? Yes. Um, it did. Yeah, that was amazing. The revisions. Yeah, I mm-hmm. love the ATX power cables. I'm a little sad that that's not a thing. For Look, I could use it for more devices. We're going down to the next level, guys. Okay, we're next level. Deep, we're going deeper. What's in we here? Have, it's the HDMI 2.1 cable. Uh huh. By the way, just for people in the audience, for so people know this, I don't trust any HDMI 2.1 cable except for the stuff that comes with consoles. Like I've yet to find <laughs> one that doesn't add dithering to my to my okay. console capture. Good. Really. Well, um, now we have a USB C to USB C cable. It's very nice of them to there provide that. <laughs> Is that for the controller? How, how does that cable yes. feel, Rich? Is that premium? Well, not particularly. It's a, it's a cable. <laughs> So, so USB C to USB C cable, no cloth uh, wrapping. On no, there's it, nothing, or... nothing crazy about it. And uh, we also have in the top compartment here, uh, we have the DualSense controller, which uh, um, you know, got mine right here. Yeah, what if, what all... if you put a screen in the middle there instead of the touchpad? Yeah, you'd get. Yeah, what these. if there was like a like a huge <laughs> screen in between it? What, you what would like you think this? about that? Yes. <laughs> oh, look at that. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. thus far this unboxing has lived up to expectations in that it is just, you know, a bunch of stuff that we knew was in there. And I'm for some reason getting it out to show you. I mean, what's, what, what's the point of it all? This um, is like the, the striptease of Digital Foundry. Let's this, go, let's go down to the lower level. All right, this is right. The, the bottom level. We're going to the yeah. basement. Oh my goodness. This is okay. X-rated. X-rated. Um, well, we've got some manuals first of all. Let's get the manuals out. Are they leather bound? PlayStation <laughs> leather bound. Yes. It's a tone. It's a, <laughs> a tone. Official yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say. Does there it actually labeled with the the revision number on it though? Like the PS five C. I don't know. What um, they call them. C- let's have a quick look. Yeah, CFI twenty fifteen. That's it. It the is. Last there one was twelve fifteen. Yeah. So this is. This is indeed uh, the, the slim model. I mean, I've got this from eBay. They could have sent anything. They could have just sent the, <laughs> yeah, the box. box so you know, this is where we Thank find you. out whether I've been scammed or not. They could have sent you an Xbox One S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Stand with PlayStation Start. We we are officially unboxed. All right. I, I got to hear your first oh, impressions on the materials and the out size. The and Pull the it weight. out like Excalibur here. Swing. It's it's happening. It's being unwrapped. Oh, you're gonna get your fingerprints all over the the the, the, the glossy the part. Top, the top yeah. part. Yep. Yep. There it is. <laughs> you did. There you did. <laughs> we have. <laughs> it's looking it's still really, huge. It's still really, huge. Looking. <laughs> it's still pretty big looking, but it's exceptionally large. Really big. Yes, there's no doubt about it. Does it feel significantly smaller though compared to the the one behind you there? Um. Well, it's according to Sony, it's a thirty percent drop in volume, right? Um, but it still feels like a a really big console. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's you know it is marginally slimmer. I noticed on the uh, PlayStation Direct page um, this week where they've uh, put it up for sale for pre order in Europe, they are hmm. actually referring to it as a slim. Which oh. I think is oh, a no. first. We haven't actually seen it, no. but yeah, there it is. No, it, I thought it was just the new PS Five. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so we will be taking a look at that. We will be doing some kind of investigation. Is, is the bottom of the disc tray flat? No. Oh, so uh, okay. well, it could be for, si- it, for well, sitting on a table, basically, because the original well, it's, is it's definitely kind of, not. It's it's kind of what do you mean the bottom, as in the oh, like the bottom. The, the bottom yeah, of it's the hard case. to say these things. No, 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 not that. Yeah. Not for standing underneath. Uh, if you lay it horizontally beneath right. the disc tray. Okay. It's very curved on the original here. unit, as you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, it's it's kind of it is it seems to be straight, and it's kind of got to be in order to get the uh, right. the, the, the hilarious stand. Try inserting the there. stand and let us know. Does it does it feel satisfying to click that stand into is place? Is there a click? Is there a click? Uh, or does it a just... mechanistic click? I can't. I can't actually see where you. Oh, I can actually. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah. 
Some reason. assembly may be required, as you're saying, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not seeing any satisfying click. It doesn't even seem to no. go in properly. But, uh, <laughs> That's not good. Maybe I've maybe I've got the wrong one. Just, yeah, oh, there's, right, two? there's two. There's two, a, the, yeah. Mm-hmm. One of greater length, girth, maybe. Oh, I see. Yeah, there is a click. Nice. Look at that. Look at that high That's class. You know that that, design. that is giving me some serious like like six late sixties furniture vibes with like a glass peg on it. It's not very attractive. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Well, you know, it it does stand up, of which you know you'd, you'd hope it to. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but well, there it is—the PlayStation Slim, um, <laughs> all unboxed. Exciting. Yeah, we have got different a- I/O on the front. We have got a couple of um, uh, USB Cs you can see there, whereas the uh, the older unit has the uh, USB A and the C. Also, they yeah. added, yeah. as you'd expect, there's an eject button next to the disc tray now, which was not That's the right. case yeah, in the original. Was confusing. We could take a look at that kind of there. You so- can see that. So Rich, the way it was in that um that like bag it came in, was it actually the opening of the bag, was it the side up that was the glossy side that you'd have to grab to get it out? No, you can get it out without grabbing the, the, the okay, glossy good. bit. Yeah. I mean it's not a big deal. I mean white gloss is okay, isn't it? It shows up um fingerprints significantly yeah, less than, too bad. than black. Black gloss. Well, it's a handsome looking console, I think. You know, in the flesh, it looks better than what I thought it would look like based on the red renders and the videos that I've seen. It looks perfectly fine, you know? Mm-hmm. I can't say I'm hugely blown away by the sort of side uh, sort of slashes on it. But, you know, I'm, I'm, it, it's a I PlayStation think, 5. I think it's that racing stripe fine. is pretty sharp. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, we have actually got a unit now, and we will put it through some degree of testing Absolute to see what's unit. what there. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, anybody looking for a, a slimmer version of the PlayStation Five, I think you know, in terms of volume, it is smaller, but it's not actually game-changingly smaller to any any degree. It is still quite large, um, but you know. So PlayStation. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that we can answer a couple of uh, supporter questions on this actually while we're oh, here. Oh really? Yeah. Let's let's go for it. Um, this one from uh, Ishrak. Uh, does Richard regret importing the PlayStation Five Slim? Now it's rumored to arrive in Europe this Black Friday, and uh, it's coming on the 29th. So I've got basically I don't know maybe uh, circa. I've had it sort of circa a week ahead of its uh, of its uh, <laughs> Head European start. launch. Um, do I regret it? Well. Possibly, but I had no idea when it was going to come when I ordered it, right? So, you know, it's basically bird in the hand, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I knew I would be getting it, whereas until yesterday, I had no idea when I'd be getting it. So that's that. Yes. That's that question. Yeah. Um, this one from Sp- Spodlude. Uh, hello, gentlemen. I've just seen on Carrie's UK that the Penta PlayStation Slim releases on 29th of November with the old fat disc model discounted to £389 in the UK. It's actually cheaper than that if you if you look around. Uh, but the new one launching at £479, surely picking up an old one and slapping an SSD in it to upgrade the storage is the better choice, right? Right. Huh. I can't see any yeah. USPs for the new Slim unless you enjoy uh, the process of shiny plastic being scratched every <laughs> time you clean it. Um, <gasps> Well, it's it, you know that there are some um, quality of life improvements to the new unit in terms of uh, I/O and whatnot, but fundamentally, you're right; it is the same machine, right? And you can get the disc unit on discounts at the moment uh, during Black Friday. And the concept of waiting a week to get a newer model that is functionally essentially the same and paying extra for the privilege doesn't really make sense unless you absolutely must have, have this unit this. rather than than that one in, in the background yeah. there yeah i wonder if so, the um, I wonder if the plastic oxidizes like some of the older white plastic you know and ends up yellowed because yellow? since it's four be it's four pieces now you'd have like part of the unit yellowed <laughs> <laughs> like it, the one that's sun like it, like an old dreamcast that's that looks like it's like the special edition like uh gold version <laughs> Mm-hmm. Only it's not well, gold. I know what you mean. 
it we'll see what it's like in 10 to 15 yeah. years. The, the process is complete. The PlayStation 5 Slim has been removed from its box. And I'm happy <laughs> to report that everything in it is exactly what you would expect. Uh, the console is um, exactly as the pictures of it suggest. Mm. Uh, slightly different in terms of actual real world perception, maybe. But it is a console in a box and it is no longer within the box. And with that... <laughs> We've reached the end of the news section of DF Direct Weekly 139. Um, okay, so let's move on to support a Q&A. This is the part of the show where every week we uh, ask our, our patrons on uh, the Digital Foundry Supporter Programme to uh, come up with a big bunch of questions to ask us, and we choose the best or rather the ones that we're possibly best equipped to answer or the ones right. that just generally amuse us for some reason or the ones that I know will wind up Alex. Um, <laughs> uh, let's kick There's off. There's a couple. Let's kick, there are a couple, yeah. Uh, let's kick off with this one from uh, Sasiki, I guess. Uh, to John, probably. <laughs> Have you seen the portal port on for the N64? There seems to be some kind of quote unquote impossible port magic involved here. Any thoughts on that? Have you tried? Have you tried it with a Never Drive or the Mister? So this was um, yeah. yeah, a port of Portal, and uh, MVG did a video on it. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, if so I had time, I mm -hmm. wanted to cover that as well at some point. But uh, yeah, it's it's freaking cool. Like it's, I mean, it's very cool. It's so interesting at what they've accomplished here with this, and it's kind of what you'd expect. You know, they've made the cuts that you would expect for an N sixty four version of a game, but mm. it still looks and feels and has all the portal elements in it in a way that's kind of surprising. And it's like, I was expecting it to, to feel almost unrecognizable to some degree, right? And it, it's the thing is, it's not just about the portal technology itself. It's just about the game running and looking anything like the original portal at all on N64. And it does. Mm -hmm. But also the portal yeah. mechanics are in there and they work, which also means there's some physics simulation happening. Uh, there's the, you know, the portal. The cube, yeah. right? Uh it's crazy. Like I haven't played that much yet, but just looking at at, at it, it's 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 a, it it does feel like a really impressive accomplishment. And this is something I'm actually really enjoying right now. Uh, is these a lot of programmers like going back to old hardware and trying to develop new things. And actually, maybe rather than just looking at Portal, there's a there's also uh, an attempt at essentially, I think XL2 on the Saturn, basically bringing Unreal to the Saturn. It's not, you know, not level for level, but, but he did a demo of this where it's like basically Unreal 1 stuff running on a Sega Saturn and looking surprisingly mm -hmm. good. So this, I love this stuff, just watching what these talented developers can do and trying to replicate way more advanced PC games on hardware that has no business running them. So, uh, yeah. Is there any specifics about uh, Portal in particular that were that were highlighted as particular challenges. Uh, I haven't actually watched. So uh, the I watched the MBG video. Oh yeah, I did case. watch that, but there's actually a video oh, yeah. from, I guess the developer who talks right. about how oh, optimizing yeah, behind the it. Scenes one. And I didn't actually watch that one yet. So I'm curious to check that out. Um, but you can kind of imagine what the challenges might be because, you know, obviously there's the physics stuff. There's the, multiple uh, just the portal concept itself yeah mm -hmm. did, have we seen anything like that on um also i like how he kind of brought over the uh the steam like uh uh menu system right like mm -hmm. it kind of replicates yeah. the original menu system and everything right. so that's there as well i, I was gonna say the, the the portal from what i understood what mg mvg talking about it is that it is actual real geometry it's not a render detection yeah yeah it's not it's so, not rtt you can tell because it's like it has real perspective and 3d depth mm -hmm. too so you're right they could try actually can n64 even really do render to texture that well at all i have no idea i've never seen i don't know if it's ever been in a game on n64 probably it's doable on the system it's probably though. doable because i think even playstation has a couple games that do that so it's probably doable but i actually feel like that itself would be a difficult technique to do effectively on n64 and that's the thing about these ports is like everything is difficult because this hardware is comes from such a different time like just the simplest things you could imagine doing in 3d on a modern system 
it would be an enormous task on something like the N64. <laughs> it just it doesn't work the same way. It's it's interestingly though, I think a game that is almost it's not obviously made for N64, but it lends itself to it better than most because it has this like chamber based design, like small small areas. rooms, yeah, small rooms, and not a lot of stuff going. It's not like Half Life Two, right? So. I can see it happening, but the, the amount of stuff that had to be manually done to get it to work is just yeah, beyond. Because even beyond when you look it's at incredible. when you look at a lot of sh- shooters and games on N64, like you look at Goldeneye, right? The the environments are very simple. They're super boxy. They're very small, but yet it still barely runs. <laughs> it's very, very yeah, slow. Still, uh, so poor. Portal's <laughs> rooms are obviously pretty small as well, by and large. And the N64 is pretty well suited to that because uh thanks to its, you know, somewhat at least forward looking, the way it handles textures and large surfaces, you know, with actual like Z buffer and perspective correction, uh, you could actually use very simple structures to do it. Like very few triangles mm-hmm. to make these boxy rooms. Whereas on PlayStation, you'd have to essentially almost tessellate it subdivide it into like a ton of little triangles and that's what a lot of games did on playstation so um yeah yeah no i i I would like to look at this more in detail and sort of wrap my head around it as well but in the for the time being yes mvg does have a nice video on that as well he also Mm -hmm. recently looked at quake 2 on playstation which i have also looked at in the past and that is another one that actually occupies a similar space i think uh, but actually came out when the system was still on the market. <laughs> so right. that one was also very, very impressive and feels like it mm-hmm. shouldn't have existed. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it looks good. I mean, I'm just looking at the MVG video now and it looks as though, you know, there is a, a, a decent amount of performance in there, bearing in mind some of the crazy geometry that's going on there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The portals and such. Even, such the te- like. the, even the textures are like, good for they n64 look, yes. they look good like yeah, n64 that was that's really good. struggles with textures because so you have that little tiny cache to work with and it's just yeah this actually these textures look good they also don't seem to be doing mip mapping which gives right. them a, a slightly sharper look than usual that's interesting mm-hmm. this they nice also save on texture the mpg video as well right yeah. right Mm-hmm. If, I guess if you don't do mip mapping on then 64 you save on memory, right? I, I would assume, yes. At the cost of sampling rate being right. higher. So you, I don't so know. So you lose but... some performance in one way, but you also gain in another with the memory, and that's probably mm. a big part of it. Which is maybe more important on N64. Who really knows? I don't really know. But <laughs> well, if you want to crazy system, system. I would say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's totally bonkers. <laughs> but I think one thing I liked is if you look at the portal gun, I'm pretty sure it's using that shiny texture uh stuff that you you could see in games like you talked about it once uh, on the bed of the the truck of the dump truck in blast core john oh the shiny texture um, Did, isn't the gu- didn't isn't they the just gun call that, that generic like environment mapping where they're just like it is probably an environment just map, like wrapping yeah, the texture I think it's awesome. around it and yeah to give it that glossy appearance it does it looks cool i agree it works looks good this makes me yeah. wonder about what could be done if somebody tried to go a little bit further and bring this to like say a dreamcast how much closer could you oh, get? Oh, it would look it would look probably great on Dreamcast, wouldn't it? I would think. think. I mean, you you'd still have to cut it way down because that, you know, but it could conceivably look much closer to the PC version. Maybe it, actually have light maps. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. I mean, uh yeah, you should check out the MVG video. I'm looking at it now. It is quite remarkable to see it actually. It looks as though he was using an M uh, an F drive to like, Yeah, that's what I did as well. Um, on original hardware, yeah. Um, okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this one from Cameron. Uh, this is our first question for baiting Alex. Um, Hi, DF crew. Uh, comparing uh, The Last of Us Part Two versus Past Face games, Alan Wake 2 and Cyberpunk 2077, the clarity of the PlayStation 5 Tilu image, mainly noise, beats a Path Trace 4090 game. Let's just let that one sink in. The only area I feel like Tilu doesn't stack up is character lighting, which is only excellent 90% of the time. Is fast facing dumb for games with a fixed time of day? Is there a hybrid solution where characters and other dynamic dynamic elements could be path faced? How how do you want to tackle this one, Alex? I'll just say that like the, the concept of noise, I don't know if this person's running them side by side on an RTX 4090, but I'm pretty sure DLSS is ray reconstruction like if you 
pump it up on a 4090, you're going to get better image quality than what you'd get out of Tilu, pretty sure. But that's just me. If that's if they're talking about noise, DLSS is very, very good. Um, that would surprise me. Um, but I think the rest of it, uh, I think there are very large aspects of the image, Cameron. Cameron? Cameron that you may be ignoring. Um they are very, very different to one another. Like anything that is shiny in the T-Lu part two, like with baked lighting, it can, to a certain degree, it's still not even very perfect for diffuse. There's a lot of things that it can't do. Uh, but for like diffuse lighting, it would only apply in a in a way that is most plausible to perfectly static environmental geometry and only for diffuse lighting. So the stuff that is just like, and nothing is diffused in the real world. Everything has a certain level of specularity to it. There's no perfectly diffused material. So it's already like only applying to Phantom one black. aspect of lighting. And yeah, it's one one material. John mentioned that this is like made in a lab. Um, and you know, so like you, you only get like diffused lighting on one real like type of surface. The rest of it though is so hacky. It, they do a good enough job for like, you just walk around and you take in the scene like from like a very like low level perspective. But as soon as you actually look, you realize it's all wrong. And as soon as you were to see the image with like path trace specularity, you'd realize that it is quite different. One thing I pointed out in the Alan Wake 2 video is that the the baked diffuse lighting or whatever they're doing for their diffuse lighting in the game in the standard rasterization approach, it makes a lot of materials in the game really overly rough looking because there's no good specularity to them in the other ways to capture it. And it changes the material quality as you get higher up. And that's something you definitely see in t Lu part one and part two. I think it's, uh, I've pointed it out before in my global illumination video because I was talking about why there's this difference in lighting and specularity and diffuse lighting at one point. If you want, check out that video. It's maybe two years old now, but it talks at one point about light maps and their limitations. Uh, and for that, like, I'll just say, like, if you were to add path tracing to TLU part one or two, it would be a better looking game. Um, and and I think one of the things it would also allow the game to be more interactive as a result too, uh, with the environments because you know obviously those games they have like a couple things you can pick up but if you notice all the things you can pick up or the or the characters they're lit completely different than the environment around them and those those are all things that you you may take notice of Cameron the next time you load it up. I mean, doesn't stuff. doesn't Cameron's conceit rely on everything being static, everything, and there's no yeah. real dynamic movement in the game whatsoever. And, and no camera movement either because specularity yeah. is camera dependent right movement, you know like so like it's it's all very it's very I mean, to be fair their but... their hacky solution to specularity is still pretty good i would say for like a traditional rasterized game but obviously still nowhere near as accurate as pass tracing mm. yeah that's that, that's the point though like yeah. so like i don't i think baked lighting has had its day to a certain degree in the next five years like it's going to become less useful as power gets more like like the next consoles are going to be able to run much more ray tracing than they currently do. Yep. It's going to have people are going to still do baked lighting now. Uh, tons okay. of releases probably still will, but like next time around, it's going to be pretty different. Well, um, looking at the final part of this question, um, Alan Wake 2 seemed to have a kind of um, hybrid solution for global illumination between the standard solution and path tracing, and it led to some bizarre sort of discontinuities and issues, right? <laughs> Yeah, it did. And that's like the one thing I, I, we'll see if we can get Remedy on the line for this and ask them a bit about their approach there. Mm -hmm. uh, fingers crossed. But uh, for that, like there could be benefits to mixing uh, like static stuff because you could technically, uh, with lower ray counts, you could get a more stable image in the areas that are most indirectly lit because you'd just be combining with textures at that point. But like the issues from the fact that textures are of a finite resolution and they only cover certain objects and they miss out on angles and all these things, that's the issues in, um, in Alan Wake 2 that actually were pretty noticeable in all the indoor sections of the game. Outdoor, I don't think there's actually any baked lighting applied to the outdoor scenes in Alan Wake 2 in the same degree, which is mm. interesting. And those areas looked phenomenal without any issues. So I don't know. We'll see what Remedy says. I, there could be a future there with more research uh, for certain game types to combine them. But Alan Wake 2, I'm only like partially impressed by it as a result. 
Okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, let's move on to the next question. This one from Helen X. Do you worry that by focusing on the advanced technical qualities of games that you contribute to an atmosphere that games can only enjoy only be enjoyed when they use the newest top spec hardware to the maximum, the ultra settings or GTFO meme? This is definitely not your intention, though, looking only at the comments below your videos on places like Reddit. Quite a few people seem to believe that. Quite a few people wrong people mm. seem to believe that but yeah. are there any methods that you use or are thinking of using to counter this idea uh, well before i hand this one over i think um our remit is to showcase the state of the art in gaming technology right however we also have a very strong focus on optimized settings which um, i think the bottom line is that advances in technology don't necessarily preclude less capable hardware because for those systems to be robust and actually shippable, inherently they have to scale. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. there are going to be some limiting factors, like you know, for example, um, uh, you know, machine learning blocks uh, for for upscaling and frame generation and um, decent RT hardware to actually power the thing. But ultimately, you know, these experiences wouldn't ship if they weren't scalable. And it doesn't, I think we, we've kind of gone on the record to say you don't really need ultra settings. Ultra settings is nice, but um, yeah, but yeah it's, it's about optimized, really. Uh, that's really where we, where we sort of have a big focus. Have, have I missed yeah. anything? Is there anything to that one, Alex? You said every, you took all, every word out of my mouth. I don't think in any of my videos would I really be saying we are only showcasing the best and like that's part of what we do but like I don't think that's like all we do and I, I would be genuinely shocked I would be really shocked that that is a common opinion of us and it's, it's a very wrong opinion because every video of mine almost has optimized settings in it some don't because it takes time to do it I've done showcase videos before but like no nah, that's not that's not what we do uh, yeah um I would also say we we have a strong retro side to DF. Yeah, like right, like that's specifically designed not... to showcase cool stuff you can do with old technology. Yeah, yeah. State so... of the art in gaming, past, present, and future. That's our yep. remit. Um, it's a shame if people don't understand that. Bearing in mind the length and breadth of the content that we do, and also the fact that you know a great deal of it is on current generation consoles, which by their very nature cannot be the best of the best. But you know, you see something like Alan Wake too, and it still looks terrific. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, different styles of content, different target platforms. Uh, hopefully, there's a good sort of uh, mix there. Um, let's move on to the next question. This one from Sloth. Do you think there is a potential niche for modern, powerful, ex exclusively handheld system in today's market, or will it be the Switch Two and various flavors of Steam Deck, ROG style devices, and streaming handhelds for years to come? Um, so, John, this is, a, I guess, is an interesting question here in that Sloth might be referring to some of the sort of handhelds of yore where, you know, we saw some actual sort of really cutting edge stuff there. I mean, the PSP for its time was fantastic. Even the Game Boy going back to when that was a thing was, was fantastic. Vita, obviously, they really pushed the envelope there. The Lynx. Lynx. Lynx, <laughs> I guess, you know, uh, the, um, the handheld... Um, PC engine as well. That was oh, quite yeah, the thing yeah. back in the day. It's nuts. The GT. Um, is there a potential niche here? I, I don't think we could ever go back to those those days of you know Sony or um, well specifically Sony producing a, a, a sort of offshoot handheld version of PlayStation. I mean, we've got the portal. That's what we've got these days. It's a streaming device. I think this niche probably is going to be. Vogue style devices and Steam Deck, right? Well, I think there's a, all of this stuff exists, and I think it's going to continue as it is. And here's what we got. Nintendo will continue to do the Switch, right? So that'll be the mass market, like big console manufacturer handheld thing that exists. That I think that will continue. Uh, the ROG style, you know, Steam Deck, the handheld PCs, I think this will continue. That's become very popular and more viable. Then there's the whole range of like uh, the amber nick and small emulation devices that exist. Uh, yeah. Those are also kind of fun and, and can be popular as well. And that's kind of carved out its own thing. And then there's something like the, the Evercade, which is around. And I actually think it's 
become kind of a pretty awesome little platform where they've got these little Evercade portables with interchangeable cartridges and they're, they've gone beyond just emulation. Now there's actually like real uh, like game, like actual game ports being made for these things. Like indie games that have come out on say steam are actually being made now really for the Evercade. We're also seeing, yeah. you know, it's a mix of modern emulation stuff. They brought arcade emulation over. So there's actually arcade games on there. Now uh, they're just releasing the Duke Nukem stuff. So like Duke Nukem one and two with the Rigel engine was ported over to the oh, Evercades. Wow. So you can play those in widescreen at 60 FPS now on a handheld from a cartridge, which I think that's really cool having games like that. So they're, they're veering into classic PC stuff now as well. And like making these like packaged like handheld versions. So I think that's a pretty cool little market on its own. It's not, it's not huge. It's not going to be big money switch stuff, but I think it's a really cool little compelling device. So between all of those, I think that's where the handheld market is, is. And although we can't leave out phones, obviously a lot of games are played there as well, mm -hmm. but because of that and the way it's shaken, shaken out over time, I, you're right. I don't think we'll ever go back to a point where Sony says, yeah, let's make a, successor to the Vita or the PSP again. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, the other thing about that device, and it's something which Switch taps into, is they're not necessarily, I mean, on the face of it, they do look like powerful devices. Well, the, the Vita did back in the day, you know, you saw Uncharted running on it. Yeah, sure. But you actually dig deep into what the hardware is, and it's not actually, you know, it's That's got to have much. decent battery life. And it is just basically um, down to the... The, you know, how great low level access is to the GPU, the CPU, and of course the um, the ingenuity of the developers in making this stuff possible. In terms of right. the sort of concept of a modern, powerful, exclusively handheld system, well, it's it is Rog Ally and, yeah, and yeah, Steam yeah. Deck, I think. And when you look at the power consumption of those things, I mean, at full pelt, the Steam Deck is the LCD Steam Decks, you know. Uh, taking about 26 watts, which is going to be at least like double what the steep, uh, the Switch 2 is going to be doing, I reckon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of nuts, really. But I think that's that's the way it's going to be. I do Absolutely. like the fact that we do have this proliferation of handhelds now, all doing different things. We've got the streamers. We've got the portal. Um, we've got the Switch 2 coming. Man, you know, thinking, back to, the, thinking back to the Vita, though, do you remember, Rich, during when they first revealed it as the NGP? Uh, yeah. there's several demos that, that there's video footage of still where like companies were showing off Vita versions of games that didn't end up shipping. So Capcom showed off Lost Planet 2 running wow. on the Vita. And I'm looking mm -hmm. at the footage wow. here again, you can see like pretty big cuts to the polygons, but it looks comparable. Uh, yeah. Konami also showed, uh, Metal Gear Solid 4 running real time cutscenes on the, on the Vita hardware, although the frame rate was quite low. Uh, it was well, still like the PS3 then. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> rich. 20 FPS cutscenes. Yeah. But um, Tish, right there. That's uh, that's a good one, Rich. <laughs> You're absolutely right. So yes, it was running like the PS3 version. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the early yeah. the early Vita stuff looked amazing, and it's a it shame. It did look amazing. We, yeah, I think man, Lost Planet Two would have been perfect for the Vita because it's kind of that co-op action monster huntery kind of thing in a way mm -hmm. would have been a good mm -hmm. good fit uh i was thinking though sony wouldn't do this again but there is actually still potential i think for microsoft to do their own xbox branded s? portable system not necessarily series s but something that maybe but basically something to, to tap into game pass on the go uh, I feel like they're, they're, them they're having, rely on the cloud for it. Though. I, I think, mm. unfortunately, uh. it's probably you're right. It's probably still going to be cloud based, which sucks because the cloud sucks for most yeah. things. <laughs> Unless I mean, you have a really fast this, wired connection. There is this running theory that the Series S is like a stalking horse for a future handheld, and I just don't see it. You know, I just as is no, it. but I don't. I don't. I it probably won't oh. happen, but I could. I could see a business Two nanometers? case for it. I mean, I don't know. They, they're in with the surface stuff they've done before. I mean, they could make a cool looking little handheld that's plays Xbox stuff. Maybe. Yeah. But I don't think they will. I just think it's too much of a, of an investment, you know, yeah, limited I know. returns. That's probably true. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, well, let's move on to the next question. Um, yeah, this one from Tom Bomb. That's Hi, DF Crew Exploration Point. Following up on a question from last week, you said the Switch 2 definitely must be a hybrid console, but in reality, the Switch Lite is already a fully portable device and is not hybrid. What if the new Switch was actually two consoles, a handheld and a home console? They could share the same internals so that Nintendo would still have the advantage of not splitting development between the two. Those players who are more inclined to play in handheld mode would get that one, and those who rarely use their console on their own could get the home console one. Rich people and fans would probably get both, and that would be a win for Nintendo. I, I just can't see it. You know, the, the whole point of the Switch is the concept that it is switchable, right? You know, it's it's a hybrid console. It covers off all the bases. Um, you're kind of moving into Series S and uh, Series X territory there, and 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 there be dragons from a, from a development perspective i suspect uh, it just makes things a lot more complicated and a lot more difficult to market and um you know the cost of developing silicon isn't insignificant either i mean obviously they would be i can kind of see the concept that it would work in that they would be offshoots of the same brand of technology right but even so it's it it kind of waters down the differentiation with the other systems uh, thoughts john i mean i think the Switch Lite was equivalent to the Nintendo 2DS, where it's yeah. basically just mm -hmm. like a continuation of that line, but like a cheaper it optional a version. version. It's a budget yeah. version. It's designed for a different use case, but it doesn't define the platform and it has zero impact on the software development. And yeah. that's the, the other key. Hero. That's yeah. the key. The other thing, of course, is that they had the die shrink on the processor, which enabled a smaller, more right, compact right, right, form right. factor and still decent battery life, which, you know, is kind of important. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting conceit, but I think it just complicates things just too much. And I don't think it's what's going to happen. And we only know of one um, SOC that's in development for Nintendo, not two. Uh, so I, I just don't don't see it happening. Uh, let's move on to the next question. This one should be quite quick, even though the question is quite long. This one from Never Ready Eddie. Uh, when talking about the PlayStation Portal in-home stream quality, no one has compared this to Moonlight, NVIDIA Game Stream, or Steam Remote Play. Moonlight, for me, streams 4K HDR 60fps with fantastic bit rates. I honestly can't tell the difference with my PC's native image. Why is PlayStation Remote Play so poor by comparison with the weight of Sony behind its development? I used PS Remote Play on the same wired network, and it is a 1080p artifact-ridden mess. I understand why DF cautions about variability in networking for poor quality, uh, but PS Remote Play has a very low upper limit on quality regardless of network conditions. Why can't Sony improve this if some guys on GitHub can make Moonlight a far superior streaming platform? Uh, I'll answer right. this one very, very quickly, and it's really straightforward, right? It's that, um, well, basically, the graphics cards of today have got really advanced media blocks, right? Really sort of cutting edge stuff. I mean, the latest ones from NVIDIA, are, you know, they're doing like eight, 8K encode, decode. It's, it's crazy stuff. But they're paying for it with transistor budget. You know, the more complex the media block gets, the more capable it gets, the more complex the logic the more transistors it uses, the more expensive it is. The whole concept of a console is about um, keeping things lean and um, best bang for the buck. So, you know, what they're doing with those media blocks is, is necessarily making them, you know, a bit less complex. So, you know, you can't have the same quality as you can um, with, with, with graphics cards that have got much better, you know, transistor budgets yep. and higher end specs that's that's the bottom line and that's why you can't do that um unfortunately i agree that there should be some sort of um higher bit rate increase on playstation remote play but um you know if you use the the uh, if you do sort of switch on to the hevc 15 megabit um uh, sort of profile that remote play has got that the portal uses it it can look okay. I'm I'm kind of more concerned about like um the the frame drop issues yeah. that I've seen on it. Yep. Um, yeah. Not really too much more to add to that one. 
Um, but let's finish off with a couple of questions lumped into one. First one All from right. Eric Benoit. I don't have a question. Oh, I just I just want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. I'm very thankful having Digital Foundry and its community in my life. I'm not able to have a social life or leave the home at will due to taking care of children with severe special needs. Video games and DF allow me to decompress and take the edge off. I'm very grateful for your great content. Thanks, Eric. Oh, that's, that's we're really grateful to you, Eric. And yeah. also, you. We obviously, it's easy to notice your name here and everywhere across DF content. So thank you for always posting such insightful and interesting questions. Absolutely. Indeed. Uh, and, and this contribution from Leftist Hominid. There are three US expats in Europe who work at Digital Foundry, Will, John, and Alex from <laughs> west to east. I'm not quite sure if Will is actually an expat, strictly speaking, but... He's no, got an accent. He's a hybrid. Hybrid, yeah. <laughs> this question is for them, so I'm not going to answer. I was wondering, do you celebrate Thanksgiving in the UK slash Germany? If so, do you try to emulate the traditions you grew up with or have you emulate. developed... Yes. <laughs> Cycle accurate emulation of the, uh, of the traditions you grew <laughs> the up youth. with. Yeah. Or, or have you developed bespoke new traditions? The bespoke is in there, so Richard is not left out. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Alex, have you um, have you got cycle accurate um, uh, tradition emulation? No, I ate salmon yesterday. I mean, what does that mean? Just, I, I did not have a Thanksgiving. Oh, you didn't have a turkey. And I, said, so I did right, not okay. get a turkey. I did not salmon. this year do anything of that. Like, I was just like, no. I mean, th there's things that I celebrate here a lot more. Uh, than a lot of things that I would celebrate when I grew up. Uh, and it's just many you know, things that you can invite your friends to. So I'll be doing a, a bigger Christmas celebration this year. Uh, okay. Kind of. Now well, you have done some Thanksgiving uh, stuff yeah. in, in the past, right, John? Do, I was invited to John's. We, yeah, do, it, we do it most years and we're doing it this weekend as well. We don't do it on actual Thanksgiving Day because it's a work day, but mm -hmm. it's great. And it's a lot of fun because a lot of my friends over here that did not grow up with that and aren't familiar with it, they really enjoy that as well celebrating other t other holidays like that and eating this kind of food it's a different experience and it's fun to share it uh okay and yeah i mean i guess it'll just be me there'll be three american natives at the celebration but it's mostly german and french folk <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> That's uh, what's with the giant turkeys they seem unfeasibly oh. large. We're not. Pictures. That's one thing <laughs> we skip it. out on. We just use chicken because those turkeys okay. are too big and take up too much space in the oven and harder to get here. Mm -hmm. These turkeys, though, these are, like John was saying earlier, these are crossbreeds. These are hybrids. Hi these hybrids. are mutants, Rich. Hybrid turkeys. <laughs> That's how they come into existence. <laughs> They've been blended. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds have quite serious. Have a good dinner it and does, everybody yeah. gather around the fireplace and watch uh, Thanksgiving. It's all good. <laughs> they're just killing. Yeah. I'm trying to think of. Are, are there any famous movies that takes place around Thanksgiving? Probably. Like you know, there's always like the holiday classics of Christmas time. But are there actually famous Thanksgiving films? I don't know. I don't know. Jeez, you in the audience? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. This is always Le leave okay. a comment in the, in the box below. <laughs> yeah, on this web zone. On this web zone. Yes, <laughs> the web zone. <laughs> Uh, well, there you go. Not exactly a, uh, a ringing endorsement of uh, US traditions, emulated or otherwise. But that's it. That is the end of the show. And if you enjoyed it, please do like, subscribe, share, ring the bell for whatever notifications mm -hmm. may emerge or what? not emerge at any given point. Um, uh, DF Supporter Program, become part of the show. Every week we uh, put out that call for questions. We ask for topics. Uh, yeah, and uh, obviously you get early access to a big bunch of videos, including D After Eight Weekly every week, and um, bespoke podcast feeds, uh, bespoke. tons of stuff going on there. Um, but that's it for this one. I guess we'll see you next week. And in the meantime, thanks for watching and supporting uh, Digital Foundry. And uh, yes, at store.digitalfoundry.net, that is our oh. new merch destination. Ooh. <laughs> oh. not co.uk what a mi no, mistake sorry yeah <laughs> we've evolved uh, anyway that's it see you next week <laughs>